welcome to the May 21st, 2019 Boulder City Council meeting. You will notice that uh, we are, our ranks are a little depleted tonight, so I'm the assistant mayor, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, and so I'll be running the meeting until Suzanne Jones gets here, which should be around nine or 9.30, um, and we have two members uh, who are ill this evening. So um, with that, shall we call the roll? Council Member Brockett. Carlisle. Here. Mayor Jones. Morzell. Here. Nagel. Weaver. Here. Yates. Here. Young. Present. We have a quorum. Barely, okay. So um, we continue recruiting for our boards and commissions. Um, we did do some interviews tonight and have filled some positions, but there, there are three positions, uh, sorry, three boards with vacancies. Um, there's the Boulder Junction Access District, which is the parking commission piece, and the Boulder Junction Access District, which is the travel demand management piece and then the University Hill Commercial Area Management Commission. So all three of those are seeking property owners or residents who have the permission of a property owner to represent them. So if you're interested, we would love to have you apply. Um, you can apply online at bouldercolorado.gov slash board stash commissions. Um, so sign up for open comment is now closed. And um, when you come up for open comment, when your name is called, Please do not speak about either of the two issues that we're having a public hearing about tonight. The two issues are Ordinance 8325, which is approving annual budget carryover, and Emergency Ordinance 8326 to adopt rules governing scooters. So you may speak to us about anything other than those two. Um, and then I would like to get a motion from Council to amend the agenda, adding the following three items. Item 8E, Police Oversight Task Force Amendments. Uh, item 8F, Asylum Seeker Discussion. And item 8G, Update on DIA uh, Routes Over Boulder. So moved. Second. Can I make an amendment to that amendment? Um, I think we um, maybe should wait on item 8D, on the appointment of um, boards and commissions for those people we interviewed tonight in light of the fact that we're a little shorthanded tonight, I'd like to give my colleagues an opportunity to weigh in. So if, if, if that would be accepted it's as a friendly amendment to delete 8D. Accepted. Yep. <clears throat> okay, so we have a motion and a second. Um, just show of hands. Mm -hmm. Okay, all in favor um, of amending the agenda? <clears throat> Great, thank you. Um, and then I think we start with open comment. Declaration. We do the declaration first. Oh yes, declaration, yep. Come on up. Here we go. I'm joined up here by Sean Maher. You'll find out why. So, it is long. It's pretty hard to annoy people by selling ice cream. You offer them a lot of choices, maybe a free sample. They get to indulge in a guilty pleasure with family and friends. And it doesn't cost too much. That was Sean Maher's life. He operated the Ben and Jerry's ice cream franchise on Pearl Street for many years, and he was doing just fine. But a group of folks asked him to help guide other small businesses and to lead the Boulder Economic Council. Then, 10 years ago, Sean was asked to become the executive director of what was then called Downtown Boulder, Inc. It was a tough job. Responsible for keeping hap happy hundreds of downtown members as diverse as restaurants, stores, bars, second floor offices, and those notorious banks. <laughs> Visitors to the Pearl Street Mall had to compete with panhandlers and skateboarders. Whenever a store or restaurant closed, there was an insistence that it be replaced by a local business. Rents went up and up. People claimed that there was no downtown parking. Locals complained about tourists. It was a lot tougher than selling ice cream. But Sean handled the job well, with grace, ease, and humor. He expanded the membership of Downtown Boulder, Inc., especially bringing in non-retail members. He worked hard to keep rents reasonable and urged landlords to favor local businesses or national chains. He made sure that downtown was clean and safe, developing partnerships with the city's police and parks departments. 
and he helped downtown grow, supporting the efforts to add more than 300,000 square feet of commercial space and 50 residential units. The list of Sean's accomplishments as the head of Downtown Boulder, Inc. would fill several pages. Here are just a few things that Sean did during his 10 years as the organization's leader. Sean founded the Taste of Pearl food and wine event, which is sold out every year. Sean started the student banner program so that art created by young people can be seen by thousands. Sean brought the Ironman and USA Pro Cycling Challenge to Downtown Boulder. Sean led the formation of the College Town Summits for the International Downtown Association and brought one of those summits to Boulder. Sean created a pop-up art gallery at the former STARS location, and he created alley art program that we're all going to start seeing this summer. There's more. Sean replaced the aging Tebow train with a new electric one that is tremendously popular with kids and their parents. Sean significantly expanded the downtown holiday lighting program, installing more than one million lights to brighten our winter nights, like tonight. <laughs> Sean procured a new bear statue for the east end of the mall, contributing his own money to help pay for it, and he secured the approval of the city for its installation, which was not an easy task. Sean started the Downtown Boulder Foundation, a nonprofit that, that presents festivals, concerts, and parades that draw more than a quarter million people to downtown every year. Sean rebranded his organization as the Downtown Boulder Partnership, reflecting the relationship between downtown and the rest of the community. And Sean partnered with the city on a comprehensive retail study, which City Council will be discussing this evening. None of this fully describes the hundreds of hours that Sean spent every year setting up concerts, cleaning the streets, dealing with landlords and tenants, helping lost tourists, and advocating on behalf of Downtown Boulder Partnership's more than 400 members. He is tire tireless, and he's always smiling. After a decade as CEO of Downtown Boulder Partnership, Sean retired from the organization last month to pursue another opportunity here in Boulder. But Sean leaves behind the legacy of a strong team and a strong organization. A testament to that is the fact that more than 20 people from around Boulder and across the country applied for his job, seeking to continue the good work that Sean started. Downtown will miss Sean, but he's always welcome to come back for a free ice cream. And so, the City Council of the City of Boulder, Colorado declares May 21, 2019 as Sean Maher Day, and we urge all members of our community to wish Sean well. I'm going to keep it short. I know you have a long meeting tonight. Um, the, down, the name of the Downtown Boulder Partnership says it all. I was in the room when a lot of those things happened, um, but I didn't do them alone, certainly not. We, we have a wonderful staff. We have great volunteers and board members, and the business community partnered with our amazing city staff, as well as our city council. Thank you all for your service and your support of downtown. Lisa, Mary, we didn't always agree. We often did not agree, but we worked together, we got things done, and we have an amazing downtown. It's a model of success for the entire country, and we should all be proud of, of what we've done downtown. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, open comments. Um, our first speaker is Sammy Lawrence. And just a reminder, because there are uh, enough people signed up, you'll have two minutes. Thank you, Councilmember Weaver. Hello, everyone. I'm pretty sure everyone remembers me, but I will introduce myself again. My name is Sammy Leon Lawrence IV. I live at 1926 Canyon Boulevard, apartment number 10, Boulder, Colorado, 80302. Many of the comments regarding pending charters at the last city council meeting, I agree with. I don't like it, but I foresaw it and agree with. My understanding comes from a previous position serving as a youth commissioner in Sacramento. It is because of this experience alone that I understand and respect part of the decision to not include me on the task force to define a community oversight board for the police. 
That being said, at the same time, there were opinions that were shared at this council that insult Mental Health Awareness Month this month, as well as me personally, our community, the original drafted charter requirements, as well as moral conduct. I shouldn't have had to seek additional healing after being assaulted by a, off a police officer because members of city council ignored or doubted my earnestness about the trauma I experienced. Your lack of understanding and empathy were revealed and you should be embarrassed and ashamed. I have been given permission by Chris Nelson, the CEO of Attention Homes, to invite all of you to trauma-informed care training because it seems that some of you lack empathy for others in dire situations. Especially you, Mary Young, you hold the greatest of my ire. As a woman who has used her race to say as she is a unifier of this community, I feel disenfranchised by you specifically, calling my actions dramatic and asinine. My bad, I, mistake that, I mistook that word. But that was wrong, specifically for you. Likewise, if I can be bold for a second, there were comments about public inf information that is not made public yet, that were not proper. We are better than this as a community, and all of you are better than this on this area. And thank you, by the way, Sam Weaver, for staying quiet, because you showed an example besides Aaron Brockett of how to be a proper city council member in this community that we deserve. So thank you, sir. Thank you, Sammy. <clears throat> Kathleen McCormick. Good evening. My name is Kathleen McCormick. I'm vice chair of the Boulder Arts Commission and I live at 3055 11th Street in Boulder. The Boulder Arts Commission is here tonight to continue efforts to coordinate arts funding in Boulder with the City Council. First, a thank you for providing the highest level ever of funding for arts and culture in Boulder. Tonight, we can provide um, information on the 2019 General Operating Support Grants that have been awarded to small, medium, large, and extra-large organizations. The overwhelming majority so far have proved in their grant applications that they were worthy of arts and culture funding, according to the city's cultural plan and the established scoring rubric for the arts grants program. 45 out of 47 organizations met the funding thresh threshold established by the Office of Arts and Culture. This means that the overwhelming majority of applicants have met our requirements and are doing a beautiful job. 45, I'm sorry, they're doing what we've asked them to do and what the cultural plan recommends. These organizations demonstrated that they've provided benefits to the community such as excellent educational and artistic events, free performances, employment and mentoring for artists, out, outreach to underrepresented groups and significant and genuine efforts toward equity and inclusion. In 2018, the Arts Commission decided to equitably divide up the general operating support grants based upon percentages of projected applicants applying for and receiving grants. The main change was that there was one less extra large GOS grant to be awarded. These funds were distributed among the small and medium organizations. A quick summary, um, the extra large organizations awarded, there were four that we awarded last week. KGNU got a score of 33.88, Boulder Philharmonic got a score of 33, E-Town a score of 32.50, The Dairy 32.29, However, there were four extra large organizations that were unfunded according to our scoring rubric. And the first three were tied. Colorado Chautauqua Association, 32.25. Parlando School for the Arts, 32.25. Colorado Music Festival and Center for Musical Arts, 32.25. And the Museum of Boulder at 31.5. There is a zero Sorry, there is a 0.04% difference between being funded and not being funded. And the next, um, the Museum of Boulder score was only 
0.75 away from being funded. These are infinitesimal differences that decide gold, silver, and bronze medals in the Olympics. We can provide similar outcomes for the large, medium, and small arts and culture organizations. Tonight, we'd like to discuss the unfunded extra-large arts and cultural organizations. Ms. McCormick. Thank you, and I believe that Bob had a question for oh, you. Yes. Thank I have you. two very quick questions, which I think are very quick answers. One, would it be fair for us to assume that um, if there was more funding provided for the Boulder Arts Commission to distribute that some of the organizations that didn't make the cut might be funded? We were hoping you'd consider this. Good, thank you. We're, we're going to be doing the budget in the next couple months, so we'll talk, we'll talk about that. Second, can you remind us again, I know uh, w separate from these grants that you, that you made last night or this week, um, when is the, um, the timing for the facilities-based grants that we um, authorized for this year? When do you, when you guys, guys accept those applications and when will you be making the grants? The applications are open okay. and we will be discussing that. We will be scoring them prior to our July meeting and then rescoring them during the July meeting. Perfect. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Mm -hmm. And you can feel free to send us the full uh, text of your comments so that we can. I think Mark did. Thank you. Um, Mark Villarreal, our okay. chair, will yep. be speaking tonight, and also Erica Jose, who's another commissioner. They have uh, additional information for you. Thank Thanks, you. Kathleen. Thank you. Next is Justin Thunderheart. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, coming today to speak on behalf of Sammy Lo Leon Lawrence IV. I, I don't come to a lot of city council meetings because I'm very proud to live in Boulder. It's a very amazing, amazing city. It's got many wondrous things to offer. I've already told my parents who travel to the U.S. that I think a great place for them to settle down would be Boulder. And up until recently when my best friend, who I clawed my way out of homelessness with and into success with and stood alongside with for so many years, was assaulted, it was the first time I had ever felt shame to be living in Boulder. And I wanted to speak at the last city council meeting, but I didn't feel it appropriate as it just felt as if I had a little too much rage uh, to speak reliably and calmly about my concerns. Now that I have the chance to speak calmly, I would like to say that I'm quite frankly appalled at how the city I'm so proud of has handled a situation in which somebody was humiliated was hurt physically and denied proper medical care. I, I love this city so much and I don't wanna say that I want to leave over something as small as this. And I don't wanna hang it over your heads like something that's some kind of awe-inspiring story. But I just want you all to know that as a citizen of Boulder that has been here for so many years, I'm extremely, extremely disappointed I've followed you guys and watched so many reviews of your uh, city council meetings and thought that you've handled so many issues so wondrously and with so much tact. I'm just left to ask where that tact is at this given time. I'm not per se angry anymore, I've quelled that, but I am very disappointed. Thank you very much for your time, city council. Thank you. <clears throat> Next is Jamie Morgan. Hi there, my name is Jamie Morgan. I'm an organizer with SAFE. We've been working for months now to enact changes at the Boulder Shelter for the Homeless in response to what the Human Relations Commission dub dubbed potential human rights violations. These include people lining up in 16 degree weather, five months from downtown, five miles from downtown to see if they'll get a bed for the night, residents being kicked out into the cold for warnings they were not informed that they had been given and then being stranded in North Boulder, a resident being kicked out for rendering emergency aid to another resident who was having a seizure that while staff looked on, and of course Benjamin Harvey being kicked out and then freezing to death on Christmas Eve. Every step of the way, Executive Director Greg Harms and Shelter Management have refused to make any changes, even as small as having shelter staff wear name tags so residents know who they're interacting with. We've even asked Shelter Management for copies of their training, training and employee manuals as a matter of transparency, and we're told they would not provide them because they're worried those materials would make them look bad. Their words, not mine. I recently met a man who lives under a bridge who said he would much rather stay there than at the shelters. His friends agreed, one mentioning that he was kicked out of path to home because he came down with pneumonia and was not able to ride his bike to the shelter every night while he recovered. 
We're gonna see justice at the shelter one way or another, but having the support of city council will make this process a lot easier for everyone involved. The shelter is a necessary service for all Boulder residents and it needs to be held to the highest regard. We wouldn't let a hospital treat people like this, so why would we allow it for our unhoused neighbors? I also want to mention that the only reason any pittance of justice was seen for Zaid Atkinson, the man harassed and intimidated by Boulder PD for picking up trash while black, was because someone filmed that interaction. The Boulder County Democratic Socialists of America and SAFE are holding a film the police training on Saturday, June 8th at noon at the Boulder Public Library in the Boulder Creek Room. It is free and open to the public. We all need to see it as our civic duty to hold those with power accountable, and this is especially true for the police who are granted the right to enact violence upon all of us. Thank you. <clears throat> Next is Robin Ryan. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Robin Ryan. Thank you for the opportunity to address you this evening, but I'm afraid that's where any level of gratitude is going to cease. I've been spending the bulk of my nights since September 1st, 2017, at the Boulder Shelter for the Homeless. In February of this year, I met with their operations director over a four-page grievance that was filed. The following Monday, he took to the airwaves and he and his executive director insisted they should not be subject to oversight because they take responsibility for people's safety. I submit to you that when the threshold is set to leave people outside waiting in the cold at 16 degrees, have n these people have no clue, a very limited scope of definition and how they see what is safe. The city funds this facility to the tune of $300,000 a year. Those are taxpayer funds. They insist they are privately run, but they are publicly funded. Unless it is your intention to be reflective of the epic failure of leadership at this facility, I'm urging you to withhold all future funding without his resignation. I'm asking you to clean house anyone who approved or agreed to enforce a 16 degree weather policy should not be delivering these kinds of services in my less than humble opinion. Two years, staff, management, board, anyone who says that 16 degrees is warm enough to remain outside while you're admitted to the building hasn't a clue of what is humane, much less charitable. Thank you. Elizabeth Black. <clears throat> Hi, Elizabeth Black, 4340 North 13th Street. Here's some information about agriculture in Boulder County from the USDA. It's also on your handout. Way back in 1950, when most of us were just a gleam in our daddy's eye, a little over half of Boulder County was farmland. The rest of the county was covered with forests and small towns. Today, less than a quarter of Boulder County is farmland, a 59% decline in agricultural acreage over 67 years. Way back in 1950, there was a whole lot of irrigated farmland in Boulder County. About 41% of the county was supplied with some kind of ditch water. Some of those ditches were junior with short water seasons, but all those lands got some supplemental water for crops and livestock. Today, only 6% of the count, entire county is irrigated, an 86% decline in the amount of irrigated farmland remaining in our county. Way back in 1950, the majority of all farm acreage in Boulder County was irrigated lands. 74% of all farm acreage in the county was supplied with supplemental water to go grow crops and pasture livestock. 
Today, the ratio of dry land farmlands is almost exactly reversed. Today, only 25% of our remaining agricultural lands have supplemental irrigation water. This has huge implications for our farmers because in our arid west, water is life, and it is very difficult to farm without it. Without irrigated lands, cash crops no longer grow, livestock carrying capacity shrink, and profit margins vanish. This is why our farmers and ranchers cherish and defend our remaining rare and precious irrigated farmland. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Darren O'Connor. Hello, Darren O'Connor, 25-year Boulder resident. I'm here tonight to talk about the recent internal affairs investigation of Zade Atkinson and the seeming lack of concern in the cases of excessive force leveled against Officer Lolatai. Given the finding of internal affairs that there was no wrongdoing when eight officers detained Atkinson, some with guns drawn, we must conclude that frankly, there's a problem with the standards. The same goes with a finding of no racial bias, which on its face leaves us surprised as a community. The conclusion of internal affairs and the police that there is a need for more de-escalation training is an obvious one, but without objective measures and policy, training could very well be meaningless. We want to know how officers will be held accountable and that de-escalation will be used in practice, not just in press releases. Recently, members of council have defended Officer Lolita's use of force where de-escalation and no force at all should have been used. 50-year-old, 5'2-inch Michelle Rodriguez and disabled Sammy Lawrence have both spoken of such incidents and Rodriguez was recently found not guilty of a charge of obstruction after a jury viewed the video of Lolita slamming her face to the ground. She was attempting to dial 911 and complying with commands when Lola Tai slapped her phone out of her hands and bloodied her face. Now we have video and a lawsuit against the city because Officer Lola Tai appeared to lose his temper and launched 40-year-old, 5-foot-4-inch Kelly Clark into the air and onto her back, injuring her. Perhaps most upsetting is Boulder knew of Lola Tai's penchant for excessive use of force before even hiring him due to an investigation of a strikingly similar example in his previous employment. Despite all of this, we hired Lola Tai and have let him loose against the Boulder community to our detriment and danger, and now the city is being sued. Just as with the investigation around detaining Mr. Atkinson, it is clear with Officer Lola Tai's incidents that there is a problem with our standards and our policies, both in hiring and overseeing our police force. The community demands and deserves better. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Catherine Breen. Hi. My name's Catherine Breen. I'm here on behalf of Leslie Birch, a former Boulder County resident. Her sister, Suzanne Wall, lived on Boulder streets for four years until she died of pneumonia and organ failure in Boulder Community Hospital in October 2014. Leslie reached out to me and other activists with Safe Boulder with the idea of creating a memory book about Suzanne's life, hoping that we could deliver it for her to policymakers in the city. This is what brings me here today. Here are some excerpts from Leslie's letter. She writes, my intent and my hope is to remind all of us that people who are homeless are first and foremost human beings. People who have taken or been forced by life circumstances to travel a path that might be beyond our ability to understand or judge. Could I have ever foreseen my precious beloved sister becoming homeless? When you look at these photos, could you? I have emerged enough now from my fog of grief to begin addressing life on the streets for my sister and other people experiencing homelessness. In January, I read about the Boulder City Council turning down the proposal to keep the severe weather shelter open all winter. My visceral reaction to that news alone moved me to tears. She goes on, I urge Boulder City Council to expand your services and affor affordable housing programs to alleviate the suffering of people living on the streets and to help prevent more families from having to endure the grief of losing a loved one to the rigors of homelessness. And now I share with you a glimpse of my beloved sister, most sincerely, Leslie Birch. Now I'd like to give each of you a copy. Um, please read her full cover letter along with the booklet. And some people are missing. If I give all of these to you, can you hand those to me? Thank you. Yeah. Over there. <coughs> Thank you. Next is Patrick Murphy. 
And then after that, Mark Villarreal. My name is Patrick Murphy, I live in Boulder. Muni Stranded Cost, Slow Lie, Part Three. So based on Boulder being 3.8% of Excel, the 120 million minus selling off 1% of Excel's power each year, A minus B, would be year one, 88.4 million, year two, 56.8 million, year three, 25.3 million, total 170.5 million, if Boulder can find a buyer of 1% of Excel's total for three years in a row, starting with 1% in year one. That 170.5 million then has to be multiplied by the number of years Excel could be expected to supply Boulder. Maybe that value would be three. So three times 170.5 million equals 511.5 million, not zero. 225 million sounds a lot better now, doesn't it? But it'll put the muni in the red well past 2033. You should know that there wasn't even a place to put stranded costs in the financial spreadsheet until 2018. And that was after a December 2017 meeting I had with community members, Heather Bailey and Tom Carr, where they committed to putting it in the spreadsheet. It took them a year, or rather eight years, to get that done. The Muni stranded cost slow lie needs full explanation, not excuses. Claims of it's too complicated are pure deceit and not professional. We have been duped, Mark Twain said. The glory which is built upon a lie soon becomes a most unpleasant encumbrance. How easy it is to make people believe a lie and hard it is to undo that work again. And I'll add, and again, and again. Thank you. Mark Villarreal. Hello everyone, I'm Mark Villarreal. I'm the chair of the Boulder Arts Commission and I live at 4140 Evans Drive. I'm gonna pick up where Kathleen left off. So um, she kind of broke down this or large or extra large organizational scoring. That same scoring breakdown and that same sort of thin margin of funding or being unfunded is throughout all the organizations, small, medium, large. Um, it was that close, it was that competitive, that close of a difference. Um, when, I, when I'm here before you, we're all here before you tonight to recommend that funding be found for the four extra large organizations that did not get a score from us. You know, we ran out of funds or we ran out of organizations. And that means 50,000 for each organization for the first year alone, that's $200,000. It's a $50,000 grant for a three, in a three year cycle. So uh, we feel that these four institutions, they're you know, some of the crown jewels of our cultural scene deserve to be funded. One thing that you need to remember is that Parlando School of the Arts and Colorado Music Festival and Center for Musical Arts do not qualify for the last remaining large grant in our program, which is the facilities grant. So they, they're left out in the cold right now. The other two organizations have a shot at some of that money. Um, in the past, the Arts Commission has discussed um, removing the um, community grants portion of our grants and rolling that into general operating support. That is only $80,000 and this is money we're talking about for next year. Um, what we have in our grants program that is not part of the general operating support adds up to $173,000. Um, we could gut that and put it all into general operating support and make a good, um, a good effort to fund these four organizations for next year, but that will eliminate community project grants, arts education grants, cultural field trips for Title I school children, professional development grants, and even more. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, next up is Leslie Glustrom. Good evening, Council. Leslie Glustrom, I live in Boulder, and uh, 
I'm here to thank you for the good progress you've made on energy and climate, and I just want to briefly respond to Patrick. He, he threw a lot of uh, numbers up about stranded cost possibilities. These are obviously very controversial and unknown. There's a number of things that ways that we can both mitigate them. But either way, we know that Excel's rates are going up and we know the cost of the renewable energy we want to buy is going down. We look, it looks like we can save many tens of millions of dollars a year on those acquisition costs for our energy if we move more quickly to wind and solar. And so uh, there's a lot of things. There's a big financial model. When the time comes, we'll take a hard look at it. In the meantime, thank you for s doing what the electric told you to do. I, if that's what democracy is about, so thank you. But I did want to just sort of bring a more positive light to this, uh, just to remind you, I think you know this, but also the community, we've met our climate goals three years early. That's been a massive amount of work by, by staff and by council staying the course. We have lots and lots of climate programs. We've reduced the energy usage in our city buildings by something like 46%. We've consulted with thousands and thousands of businesses and homes. We have worked and the staff has worked and the council has stayed the course incredibly hard to do that. We've separated our, our GNP, which is going up dramatically, the orange line, from our greenhouse gas emissions, which are going down significantly, not where they need to be by any means, but this decoupling of of economic growth and greenhouse gas emissions is a huge accomplishment. And, and everybody in this community should be very proud. The councils that came before you, again, the staff who's worked so hard, this is really a big deal. And then I'll just briefly mention, for those that don't know yet, we have a carbon farming project to get carbon out of the atmosphere and into the soils, being led by EcoCycle. If you just look up carbon farming, EcoCycle, it's a ton of fun. Thank you so very much. Let's keep going. Thank you, Leslie. Um, next, James Feeney. Hello, James Feeney from North Boulder. First to comment, uh, carbon monoxide monitors, a cheap off-the-shelf commodity product go underutilized when carbon monoxide is continuing to send people to the hospital while on stay in Boulder and Longmont hotels. The 2012 International Building Code and Fire Code requirements for carbon monoxide alarms adopted by reference do apply to both Group I and R occupancies, which includes hotels, motels, and apartments. The Boulder Hotel, where this carbon monoxide poisoning incident occurred, received and retained a sales and use tax license without complying with the fire code requirements. How do we know then that all the hotels within the city of Boulder are currently in compliance with the carbon monoxide monitoring standards, given that the city council expressly disclaims any liability for building code non-enforcement by city manager, and given that there are potentially lethal consequences. I support city council budget allocations for necessary and sufficient number of qualified fire safety inspectors and rapid adoption of last year's international code revisions. Second, I have a question for city manager again. Five weeks ago, uh, city manager suggested both that the dark sky ordinance might be enforceable, and also suggested that Boulder City ordinances uh, could not be enforced against either party to a mobile home park land lease. That legal theory struck me as fanciful at best. Specifically, the legal theory seems to directly contradict the general language of uh, Boulder Vice Code Chapter 10, 2.5, Abatement of Public Nuisances, and especially Section 4, Nuisances Prohibited, which specifically references any person having a leasehold interest in any lot. And subsection 4, 12, 2C, which paraphrasing says, no person shall alter any building in a mobile home park unless the person complies with all applicable city codes. So now, after an additional five weeks of review, has city manager finally uh, compiled supporting documentation for this legal theory of non-enforceability and where uh, the Boulder Charter uh, imposes a duty to enforce what position then on enforcement or non-enforcement with respect to Boulder's dark sky ordinance in effect now for four and a half years has city manager formulated. Thank you, Mr. Feeney. Erica Jews next. Good 
Good evening, Council. My name is Erica Jost. I um, live at 1951 Vista Drive in Boulder. Um, I wanted to start off by thanking you so much for the bolstering of funding this year, especially with the facilities grant. As an Arts Commissioner, it's been an honor to work with these organizations, and I'm going to expound a little bit on why um, the funding would be really necessary and how the organizations are really living up and beyond kind of our request to ask them to push past flowery language around inclusion um, and really kind of strong pipelines um, to towards inclusive work in the city. Arts and cultural, and cultural organizations are blossoming beyond their arts and culture roles in Boulder. In addition to being model organizations of artistic excellence in all arts modalities, visual, musical, dance, theater, historical, and curatorial, they are making dynamic strides towards inclusion and collaboration with non-arts community organizations that we haven't seen before. In the past two years, we have witnessed a number of non-arts community organizations being included in arts and culture projects in meaningful and impactful ways. These include and are not limited to the Community Foundation, Boulder Valley School District, Right Relationship Boulder, El Centro Amistad, Circle of Care, Out Boulder, and Black Lives Matter 5280. The Arts Commission has demanded this from our cultural and artistic organizations, and they are all rising to the challenge. Arts organizations doing high quality, critical community building cannot be unseen and unsupported by the city. These organizations work incredibly hard to meet the standards for these grants. We have a responsibility to ensure they are merited for their work so they can continue creating genu genuine avenues of engagement for Boulder's underserved and marginalized communities. Um, we had some conversations with some organizations after the last grant cycle and um, some members of, especially in the, particularly in the small grants um, organizations, left pretty despondent as it's not just if they will have to leave Boulder and find other communities to do their work in, but when. And we find that that's um, a critical issue. So thank you again for all of your service. Thank you. John Glades. Mr. Glades here. No. Rachel Friend. Hey, I'm Rachel Friend, Fraser Meadows resident. Um, and before I start with, with what I wrote up, I wanted to take a moment and say that I, I think broadly I'm here on the same thing that Darren and Sammy and sort of these front three rows are on. Um, they're talking about policing tactics and sheltering people and um, basically making sure that you all have compassion for those of us who are vulnerable and need your protection. And my sense is that people don't feel that you are showing us compassion and taking care of business in the way that needs to be done to make sure that your constituents are safe. Um, as I'm sure you all know, the plan for flood mitigation for South Boulder Creek got flushed down the toilet yesterday. Um, so that's the lack of compassion that I'm here to talk about. You all chose this single plan that CU told you was a dead end, that everyone in harm's way told you was a dead end, and that your expert advisory board, Rab, told you was a dead end. Um, we all, in my neighborhood, pleaded with you not to pick variant one because that would for sure mean delays. Um, and delays, since lives are in danger, is something that we were so eager to avoid. Um, and that's especially true because you had three other viable options. The expert engineers you paid millions to said that variant two, 500 year, was a perfectly viable concept that also gave you the same benefits as variant one. But here we are, <laughs> nine months after your vote, to pick the only option that was a surefire dead end, and we're back to square one. Um, and I don't know what your end goal is, but common sense tells me it cannot be to protect lives as quickly as possible, because if that had been your goal, you wouldn't have gone with the option that was guaranteed to create delays. We're at nine months, it's probably going to be years. Um, so. I would ask at this point, what are you planning to do? Um, I would hope that you're going to hold an emergency meeting and get a move on with variant two 500 year because that is the only viable path forward at this point if indeed you want to urgently protect our lives. Thank you. Thank you. Lynn Siegel. Lynn Siegel, Mountain Heights. I have to respectfully disagree with Rachel. Um, I think it's really disingenuous for Francis to now say this and bring up the neighborhood downstream. All of Boulder is affected by o overtopping on um, on the highway, uh, you know, 36. And um, sometimes things take time. 
to do things right, like re, like change a whole alluvium, takes time. Um, now, what I wanted to talk to you about today is deconstruction of alpine balsam, and um, it occurred to me in talking to a, recon, a deconstruction person, Russ, um, that city staff were consulting with about this, that um, the new houses these days are not reusable. Okay, there's glue, there's all this stuff, and we're building as fast and as high as we can. Um, you know, this is the model, you know, no open space there, you know, just like build, 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 and, um, and all this new build is not reusable. So there's an embodied energy cost that isn't being accounted for. Um, the deconstruction uh, at Alpine Balsam is like something that really needs to be <laughs> thought out very carefully and the reuse value of the embodied energy, the full life cycle analysis of all the products that go into a building, taking each nail out, all the labor, all of this stuff is really um, costly. Um, so I say think twice. Um, we probably could do some creative architecture in spite of what Suzanne's saying, that it's dark and everything. There are ways to do things. Thank you, Lynn. <coughs> Diane Curlett. Good evening, Council. I'm Diane Curlett. I live in Boulder, South Boulder. I'm here to talk about the FAA's planned westbound jet departures over Boulder. We've sent you information um, and we can share it with other people who would like to have it. But the short story is that FAA in about 2013 uh, ramped up um, the flights over Boulder. They changed the direction of the departure flight path one of them. And by 2017, um, everybody was noti noticing major noise problems in South Boulder. Um, it's like having a jet freeway overhead when they turn on that heading and to send the planes over us. Um, the rock faces to the west of our town really create a lot of extra uh, noise, re reverberating noise, and this is not accounted for in any of their computer simulated noise studies. So they treat us like we're flat ground and we're not, and a lot of people down there are really suffering from this extra noise. Um, we've been trying to work with the FAA for a couple of years. A, a group of people have continuously worked on it. And the FAA is not too interested in listening. But just recently, they put out their final plan for what they want to do for the jet uh, pathways and decided graciously to move the one we're suffering under uh, 0.5 miles to the south of the city limit, uh, the southern city limit, which really does not solve anything. They admit that it's not gonna solve the problem. Um, so we are hoping that you will uh, help us get them to adopt a complete Zimmer noise resolution. This would adjust the departure route south over Rocky Flats where they were historically. And the deadline for this comment is June 6. We hope you will take supportive action before that date. The FAA has not been responsive to citizen groups. We need your help to restore some peace and quiet in our neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, Lynn Hurst. Good evening. Uh, I'm Lynn Hurst, I live in uh, Southeast Boulder. I've been sending this to you now for four years. So I'm hoping that maybe some of you will reconsider Alpine Balsam as a homeless shelter instead of offices. Uh, as, a, as a homeless shelter, the rooms would be efficiency apartments. They each have a bed, furniture, TV, closet, dresser, sinks, bathrooms. The nurses stations can be converted to common areas. The common areas can have a small kitchen. The extra rooms on the floor can be a library, computer room, classrooms, laundry rooms, exercise equipment. Each floor can be separated into a male wing, a female wing, couples wing, a uh, family wing. You could have a li assisted living and a hospice wing. 
Um, the ER could become a doctor's office or it could be a people's clinic. The lobby can have a dentist office or dental aid. You could have your gift shop, which already is there, your optician glass store, a hearing aid store, pharmacy, a thrift store, beauty shop, barber shop, coffee shop, bakery, flower shop, it's endless. The main lobby can be open to the public. You have a, a records room downstairs that could become a library. You have a cafe already there. It could be called a down under. It could all be open to the public. The uh, records, uh, the uh, upper floors, elevators, and stairs could be accessible only by a key card. The top floor would be reserved for teens, 14 to 21, accessible by a special key card that only they would have. That would keep them safe and protected. The main floor has a lot of back rooms accessible only by hallways. These could be used as classrooms. You could have out on the job training in HVAC, plumbing, electrical, computers, landscaping, social media, food service, accounting, secretarial. They could get their diplomas, not GEDs. They could apply to colleges and get grants. They would be qualified to get jobs because now they would have an address. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Okay. That is the end of open comments. And Lynette, now we move to consent agenda. Or if um, oh, staff has a response. Staff. Yep. So one of the speakers tonight, Ms. Curlett, was talking about the FAA. And we had scheduled that later this evening, but I can address it now if you'd rather. So there was a public meeting, a series of public meetings by the FAA at the end of April and early May. Our staff attended those and um, our understanding and listening to the comments that we're receiving from our residents. The last time that the FAA asked for comments was in 2017 and Mayor Suzanne Jones sent a letter to the FAA which perhaps resulted in some of the minor changes that they're making now. The deadline for current comments is June 6th and we are working with Mayor Jones to send a letter on behalf of our community urging the FAA to make further changes to support um, our request that noise be reduced in South Boulder. So that will be sent out on time and we urge the residents to send letters as well. Jen, do you need a motion from us on that or are you just gonna do it? We're just gonna do it. Thanks. Anything else? I've not. Anything from council? Thank you. Please. Um, thank you, Jane, for the FAA comment <coughs> on the Metroplex. Um, there was another person who came up, and I may have missed a uh, report, but James uh, Feeney spoke about enforcement of dark skies in mobile home parks, and I don't know if you've, he talked about something you had sent out, I may have missed it. No, so he, um, Mr. Feeney appeared, I think, uh, several weeks ago right. in April to make these um, statements, <laughs> and the, the answer to those statements is that apparently because mobile home Mobile homes are located in parks owned by pri private property owners. We are not able to enforce it. I checked in with staff and they told me that they had spoken with Mr. Feeney before and that there's not a change in the interpretation of the ordinance. So would there be an opportunity for us to reach out to the owners of the mobile home parks and see if we could uh, um, look at that? I, yes, I suppose we could do that, but we cannot force them to do it unless there were some sort of ordinance change, perhaps. I, so I, I, I would rely on the city attorney's office to tell us if we could do that or not. Okay. I mean, it's, um, I guess I would like um, our residents in mobile homes to have the same basic rights as others who live in non-mobile homes. Yep, we all would. Yep. So <clears throat> I'd like to look into that. Anything else from council? Oh. Okay. Items A through R are before you tonight on your consent agenda. Mary. I have a question on item 3E, um, which is the air rights um, on uh, 2920 Pearl Street. 
let me see if I got the address correctly. 2920 Pearl Street. Um, I just wanted to understand how um, the bridges can be built prior to obtaining a permit for them. There he is. Hi, Mary. Chris Mestrick, Interim Planning Director. So to clarify your question a little bit, the question of the construction that's happening on the site now versus the process that they're going through to obtain the air rights easement now, is that what you're really right. asking? Uh -huh. Correct. So the, you're correct that the construction is underway at that site, and actually the the second item in this revocable is related to the bridge on the site, and the bridge is also already in place. So um, at the very end of the memo, we talk about the matrix of options. Council does have options if you don't want to approve this lease. Either they can do a short term, less, you know, three years or less, or um, they would have to stop and redesign the project. So it was built without a permit <laughs> getting applied to? Is that what happened? It, no, the the overall design, that master site design, um, was approved as a part of the overall site review, including that bridge connection, and then the ditch and the um, slough that runs through the site. Um, it's a matter of just making sure that they have that right revocable lease because they're crossing a city easement. Uh -huh. And in the city code, it talks about that if you if you're going to cross a city easement, um, you need to be able to have a revocable lease for that that space. Okay, so let me see if I understand this. So it was approved at site review and the bridges were there at site review. And so this is kind of like um, doing the, the construction work and the permits for something such as those bridges are obtained during that part of the process, not prior to site review. Correct. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <coughs> So we no longer have a quorum. <laughs> Don't make any decisions. <laughs> I'd like to move the entire consent agenda. Second. Okay. Show of hands. This is a roll call. We start with Council Member Carlisle. Aye. Morzell. Aye. Weaver? Aye. Yates? Aye. Young? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. You have three call-ups before you tonight. A drainage easement vacation for 746 Cottage Avenue, a landmark alteration certificate for 835 Pine Street, and a landmark alteration certificate for 1836 Pearl. Does anyone have any interest in calling any of these up? Okay, seeing none, we can move on, I guess. Your first public hearing is second reading of Ordinance 8325, approving annual carryover and supplemental appropriations. I'm going to make a statement. I know there's a couple of people that came this evening wondering about the outcome of 746 Cottage Avenue. So the fact that we did not call it up means that we won't be taking it on tonight. So those of you who are here for that can go home. So the next item on the agenda, as Lynette indicated, is the supplemental public budget appropriation, which we always call the first adjustment, adjustment to base. Um, I don't know if you guys know Gina Caluzzi, but Gina has been with the city for a number of years and works with the budget department. Um, our budget officer, Katie, was not able to be here this evening, so Gina, take it away. As Jane said, I'm a senior budget analyst in the finance department, and um, I'm here to present the first adjustment to base. So each year, council has the opportunity to adjust the annual budget. Um, so we usually, usually these requests fall under one of these four categories. They're new or additional revenues received, but were not budgeted. They're projects that started in a prior year, but not completed. Also, grant revenues tend to span. Pardon me. Year. I don't mean to interrupt. Can you speak into the mic? Some folks oh, are having trouble. Not coming hearing. through. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Just put it up to you. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Up. Up. Oh. 
Okay, how's that? It's better. All right. Um, and the fourth, the last category here are additional priority needs that were identified since the annual budget process. We bring forward two formal supplemental budgets annually in May and November, and occasionally we have a need for an off-cycle supplemental for special things like tax initiatives that were approved but not budget, the revenues and expenses weren't budgeted, or time-sensitive large item needs where the funding needs to be done before we can get it into one of our formal supplementals. So we typically have two types of carryovers. Uh, the and the, the first um, adjustment to base typically has our, or we have two, t I'm sorry, we typically have two types of budget adjustments, carryovers and supplementals. Um, typically, carryovers are in the first adjustment to base only, and these are usually projects often for capital or operating projects such as master plans. We also have carryovers for grants where the timing of the awards are different from the fiscal year. We also have supplementals, and supplementals either come from fund balance or a new reven revenue source, um, and they're usually for new initiatives uh, that were identified in the current year. The 2019 first <coughs> adjustment to base is a total of $191 million, and of that, 28.3 is in the general fund, and 162.7 are in restricted funds. And you can see the breakout here between carryovers and supplementals. And there is some additional revenue uh, associated with those supplemental adjustments. Just to give you a historical perspective of what we're bringing forward tonight, um, here's a slide that has our previous three years plus 2019 of our first adjustment to base. And if you'll notice, there's a big variance between 2016 and 2017 and 2018 and 2019 in restricted funds. That's due largely to capital project carryover. The general fund, as you can see in 2016 and 17, have been about $17 million. Um, 2019 is $28 million, and that includes an 11, uh, an 11, million, 11.85 million um, adjustment for hospital deconstruction costs. Uh, 2018 was a little less than what we have normally had because of all of our budget reductions and holding the line. So this slide just represents a few of the types of adjustments that we have um, in, in the first adjustment to base for the general fund. Um, for example, uh, of that 12.2 million in carryover in the general fund, there's about $3 million in there for innovation technology and capital carryover. There's also $900,000 for the Scott Car Carpenter Pool, and $2.4 million for electric utility development, and about $600,000 for substance abuse awareness. And as, part of, as for our new supplementals, um, that total was about $16 million, and of that, I already mentioned the 11.85 uh, for the hospital deconstruction. There's also addressing some unfunded needs here um, for Fire Station 3 and also additional for um, the de Fire Station deficiencies and equity compliance and the fires, fire record management system, and those total about a little over $2 million. There are also additional resources for marijuana licensing and compliance, and what I didn't mention before was that usually these adjustments to base are for one-time funding, but we do have an ongoing funding um, supplemental here, and that's what this one is at a total of about $938,000. I'm sorry, before we move on to the next slide, just a quick question mm -hmm. on um, the electric utility development project uh, carryover. Um, that's not a, um, a use of general fund for the um, utility, that's some um, use of the utility occupation tax, is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Yes. And there are also some, we have another question. Oh, yeah, I have a quick question. Um, uh, regarding the marijuana licensing and compliance, I was just curious to know if you have a more detailed slide coming up or is this the opportunity that I would 
Uh, we don't have a slide on it. There was more detail in the agenda, but we do have staff here that could perhaps okay. address well, question. well, I have a question. Um, in the memo um, on page 636, um, there's a reference to, um, I'll read the paragraph. Workload related to marijuana businesses has increased substantially over the past five years as the industry has changed and matured without additional dedicated resources. In lieu of capping marijuana businesses, the working group is requesting the following additional resources. And I was curious um, to know what working group that was referring to. Um, what we did is we created an internal working group to um, figure out what additional resources were needed because we were having a staffing issue with regard to the marijuana businesses. So it wasn't a special working group, it wasn't the marijuana advisory okay. panel, it was an internal group. Okay, great, thank you, that's very helpful. Um, and then um, just another question regarding the numbers. Um, there's... Um, 3.7 million, that is revenue um, from the excise tax, and then the 788,470, which is the total expenditures. So does the balance go to the general fund? So the revenue brings in approximately, um, the marijuana revenue brings in approximately $4 million to the mm -hmm. general fund every year, and so that amount is being is gonna be reclassified as ongoing revenue. And currently, with our expenditures, we have about $2 million that we're using for our ongoing needs, and there's about $2 million that's gonna be available for our ongoing needs for future use. Okay. And, and so just to clarify, it, not, I mean, Gina said it, but I'm gonna say it a different way. In the past, we have used these marijuana revenues as one-time revenues because of the position that the federal government takes with regard to them, but we now believe that in starting in 2020, not this year, but in 2020, we will be recommending the council count them as ongoing revenues. So we're already taking two million off the top for the, doing the marijuana work itself, and the additional two million that we'll be getting will be using for general fund purposes. And prior to that, was it classified as part of the? It was one-time revenue, and we used it sometimes for, for capital or one-time other expenses okay. in the general fund. Okay, thank you. So I have a question, and I, put, and I don't know if this is the right place to ask it. I can wait. But I put out a question um, tonight about um, about the, our April 9th study session, and we looked at a whole bunch of other options or other things that we were interested in, and I really don't see an accounting of all of that, and so I'm wondering where that is. So we didn't, we decided, we decided not to sort of rehash that. Um, the items that you, put in your hotline are these. Fire station deficiency and equity compliance are in this first adjustment to base. And that's, I thought that was up there, but I guess not. Um, the, you had, we had transportation core maintenance and operations, again, in the first adjustment to base. Then in the 2020 budget, <clears throat> what we intend to bring forward is the municipal building east door entry, and we can't do it now because we're still finalizing costs on that. The radio services infrastructure, the library master plan maintained service level. <clears throat> Sorry, so those will be in the 2020 budget. Right, but in this report, I mean, reading this tonight was really uh, somewhat difficult. I don't think it was really well put out there in terms of what we're approving. And, uh, you know, we went from April 9th to tonight or today's memo, and um, it's like apples and oranges. So I'm just, uh, you know, I do you have a slide from the April 9th meeting? Put it up. Oh boy, it didn't come out right. So this was one of the slides that we had um, with all of the immediate needs and what the total cost was. Um, and then this next slide, I'm a, I apologize for this. I just copied these over real quick and didn't realize that they were all. 
on this. Right, so what we discussed on April 9th is that we do not have the current dollars to fund all of these items. And so actually, as a result of the April 9th discussion is why we had the meeting last Thursday to talk about whether or not we were going to be moving forward with Alpine Balsam and the hospital deconstruction, particularly because we know that the total cost for that is going to be somewhere between 11 million and 16 million, and I think we chose the larger number. Um, so we had that meeting and the council uh, directed us to move forward with the hospital deconstruction, so we are moving in that direction. But we knew too that we should try to be able to find the um, dollars to do some of these things even though we can't cover every th single thing. And so uh, we're adding money, as Gina talked about, for the fire station three construction. We have dollars for the fire records management system. Um, we are talking about, we're adding, I don't know if I see it on here, the, oh yeah, in the bottom, the fire station deficiency and equity compliance. The municipal building east door will be in 2020. Lawns Gardens will be discussing in um, October and we'll be finding money for that. Um, let's see, what other ones? The living wage increase will take effect in 2020. The Transportation Corps Maintenance and Operations, we funded in this first adjustment to base. The Library Master Plan will be in 2020. The Radio Services will be in 2020. So almost all of them are ones that we are going to take care of either this year or next. Okay, it would be helpful to have this broken down so we know what we're doing and uh, approving. <coughs> so if that, if I appreciate it, your response, but if we could get that in writing so that we in the public know what we're moving? Yep, so we can follow up um, after this evening with this list and, and where the dollars are coming from. Yeah, and it would also be helpful in front of all of these, they don't have, I mean, this has some breakdowns, but it'd be nice to know the breakdowns that we got in the April 9th study session. Back it. Okay, thank you. We'll take care of that. Thank you for putting that together. Welcome. Let me back to where we were. Oh, and I just, so continue on with this slide. Um, there are a few staffing needs in here for planning and public works. And also the council assistant is included in this adjustment. So some examples in our restricted funds of budget carryovers are and the total of this was about $156 million in total carryover. There's about, and these are just some examples of items that are in there. This is not indicative of everything. Um, there's $800,000 in community housing assistant programs. There's about $16 million in the community cultural and safety tax, and 8.1 million of that is bond proceeds for fire station three. How, mu how much in the, Community, culture, and safety tax? Uh, total carryover is ab about $16 million, and 8.1 of that is for Fire Station 3. Thank you. And that's funded with bond, bond proceeds. And capital improvement? How much? Um, well, total, well, I don't have total CIP. The majority of the 156 million dollars is CIP, and a large portion of that is in the utilities funds, that's $64 million between all of those funds. And there's also $15 million in the open space fund. So the utility fund, just for an example, the wastewater fund has $32 million alone in CIP carryover uh, for very sewer replacements and rehabs, and OSMP, the $15 million carryover includes uh, about s uh, seven and a half million for current and future acquisition of lands. So moving on to the budget supplemental examples, um, this Vision Zero implementation is also part of that transportation core and maintenance operations, and that's about $600,000. Um, so also there's additional funding for the Scott Carpenter Pool in the amount of 1.5 million. Climate Action Plan tax programs initiatives, 
uh, $630 million, and about $360,000 in various parks and rec grants. $630 million or I'm thousand? sorry, $300, $360,000 in parks and rec grants. And how much? 630000 in Vision Zero and Transportation Corps maintenance and operations improvements. How much in Climate Action Plan tax programs? That was 630000 Okay. So I would just like to comment that I agree with Lisa that it'd be helpful if the numbers were broken out yeah. and associated I mean, with the topics just for, this for us and for the right. public as yeah. well. Thank you. Right, there's there's an attachment to the agenda that has lots of detail. Which that attachment, make sure eyes. yeah, that attachment <laughs> is not helpful yes. at all. I agree. And with so, uh, you know, th this is not a really good way to move forward with the budget. And in presentations and in the materials given to us, it needs to be spelled out exactly what money is being spent for the council to know and for um, the public to be aware of and um, doing this at the last minute doesn't work. Okay, we'll work on making that more clear. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> so the, I wanna make a note that the packet actually contained two copies of Ordinance 8325, one with the hospitality construction costs and one without. And staff is recommending consideration of the version with the deconstruction costs in it. And that's the end of the presentation. I stand for any further questions. Any questions? Mm -mm. We have a public. Yep. Right. So, shall we open the public hearing? We just have one speaker. Okay. Matt Frommer. So you will have three minutes. Great, thanks. <coughs> Not for three minutes. Hi, thanks for having me. So my name is Matt Frommer, I'm a Boulder resident, and I'd like to comment on the proposed electric scooter moratorium. I think this is a bad idea for a number so of reasons. So that's gonna be a public hearing next, so we're doing the budget right now. Okay. Please. I think I signed up for this one, though, so. Is it on the budget? No. Okay. Well, why don't you wait till the next hearing, then? Cool. <laughs> okay. no. no. We can't do anything. <laughs> Sorry, we don't have a quorum, so. <laughs> Till we get a couple people back. There we go. Oh, yeah. yeah. There we Quick. go. I would like to move, I uh, got I lost track of the ordinance number. Uh, ordinance uh, number uh, 8325, version A, which I believe is the one that includes the hospital deconstruction that we discussed last week. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Second. Okay. Discussion? I won't be supporting it. Um, I won't be supporting this because I think still with the Alpine Balsam project, I still think we have a lot more work to do. And I still do not think the deconstruction has been properly vetted. And I want to know some other versions um, in terms of how that building could be reused. And could you take down part of it, but not all of it? And it seems to me from the get-go, um, it's been kind of pre-assumed that we're gonna take this whole thing down at the start. And um, there hasn't been, I don't think, really uh, detailed analyses except that, oh, this is the way it's gonna be and oh, it'll be too expensive if we repurpose it. I've been speaking with different people who are in the building industry and um, they seem to think that we could do a little better and save the city probably about half of what is right now being planned. So um, I will write an email before um, in the next week or so 
um, laying this out and we'll plan on discussing it when it comes to us on June 4th. Um, I'm not gonna argue with Lisa, but I do wanna just state for the record that when we met last week and discussed this pretty extensively, um, the, the, the net result was we are going to deconstruct some of the hospital buildings, but not all of them. Um, the deconstruction will involve about three quarters of the square footage of the buildings in existence. The other quarter will be preserved. That includes the Brenton building, the parking garage, and the pavilion building. Now we have some work to do on the pavilion building on the cost of that, but I just wanted to be clear that we're not um, tearing down the entire hospital. And, and I appreciate that, Bob. I, um, I'm talking about the part that is being discussed. I don't see, there's been no discussion about reuse of the basement and to use it as a council chambers, <laughs> a underground theater, some other kind of creative um, space. There's 210,000 square feet um, of um, rooms that I think could be repurposed. And um, so anyway, I want to see uh, another analysis and I'm not willing to move forward on this request. Okay, anybody else, Cindy, Mary? Okay, so. This is a roll call vote. Okay. We start with Council Member Morzell. No. Weaver. Yes. Yates. Yes. Young. Yes. Carlisle. Aye. The motion passes four to one. Mm -hmm. Does that work? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a majority. Thanks. Your second public hearing tonight is first reading reading of ordinance eighty three twenty six regarding commercial electric scooter companies. Maybe two thirds, yeah. Two thirds of those present. Yeah. Yep. Hi, I'll be presenting this. Uh, I'm Tom Carr, I'm the city attorney. Uh, with me tonight are Kathleen Bracke, uh, uh, interim transportation director, and DK Kemp, who's one of our transportation managers. Um, the purpose of this agenda item is to discuss the potential, uh, emer it's an emergency ordinance to, pro um, to prohibit uh, the city manager for a period of approximately nine months to uh, from issuing business licenses to commercial electric scooter businesses, scooter companies. It would not prohibit the use of uh, e-scooters on streets. It would prohibit the use of e-scooters on sidewalks, multi-use trails, and on open space. To be clear, current law prohibits that. Um, but it's a, to, to get to that point, you have to look at several different parts of the traffic code. I'm recommending that we include just a line in this for clarification so people know what's legal and what's not. Um, the, count, the purpose for the, uh, the moratorium and the reason why we're doing it is, as I said, it's currently illegal in Boulder. Uh, the legislature passed House Bill 19-1221 on May 9th, which will legal legalize the use of e-scooters in streets and preempt the city from prohibiting them. Um, again, we're not going to prohibit them, but we are concerned about the e-scooter companies coming into the city uh, without any kind of regulatory framework, which we have not had the opportunity to develop. Uh, several e-scooter companies have expressed an interest in operating in Boulder. Um, we've seen, as many of you have probably seen, the impact of e-scooters around the country. Um, it has different impacts in different places. Uh, they've prevented, presented safety, environmental, and particularly disabled mobility challenges because they tend to be left on sidewalks. Um, e-scooters could provide an environmental and social benefit. I can't tell you how this is going to come out one of the things that we have learned over the last few years, that community engagement before making major decisions is incredibly important in the quality of those decisions. I think back to the process that we use for short-term rentals. I mean, many of you may recall that when we first did short-term rentals, the plan was to ban them because the hotel industry wanted that. And then this room filled up with a bunch of people who were doing it. And council engaged in a long legislative process, taking the community input there. And I think one of the lessons that we all learned from that was take your time, hear from the community up front, and then 
engaged in the legislative process. So our transportation staff um, ha has developed a, a, an engagement process. Um, some of the things that you need to look at um, is how you regulate the e-scooter companies. There's some interesting technology that's out there that we don't know how good it is or whether it works that well. I think that should be explored. Um, where, you, where they're allowed. There are pros and cons of allowing them on multi-use paths um, that w that need a real good community conversation to develop. Uh, obviously, open space is a completely separate question. I'm not suggesting that e-scooters be allowed on open space, but it certainly should be part of the conversation. Uh, and then, at, as Sam raised it, um, at CAC, one of the questions that I think needs to be addressed is, what about other potential micro-mobility options like electric skateboards, which we're seeing around Boulder with some frequency now. Uh, we don't have any framework for regulating them, and we don't really know about them. So the plan is to, um, well, I actually have a little bit of data. Um, that's really fascinating. This is from uh, 2018. There were um, 36.5 million trips in the United States on station-based bike share, 9 million trips on dockless shared bikes, and 38.5 million trips on shared scooters. What this sort of shows is what I think many people have seen, is that um, dockless bikes were originally the concern, and as you may know, we have a pilot project going on with dockless bike companies, but the technology has outpaced those companies, and for the most part, they have moved their business from dockless bike shares to dockless scooters. And so we're kind of a step behind the, the industry, which is always challenging, and this is a, is a, is a quick-moving industry. Um, but you can see that the number of dock bites uh, has gone up in 9% from 2017. So we're, we're seeing station-based bikes growing as a micro-mobility tool, uh, but we're also seeing around the country an, a significant increase in the use of shared scooters. Um, some interesting th st safety information. This was in an article that was attached to, um, it was actually a study that was that was uh, linked from the memo. Um, they did a, the, the Center for Disease Control did a study in Austin, Texas from September 5th through November 30th, 2018. And they found that during that period, 271 people were injured on scooters. Uh, half of them had helm had head injuries that would have been preventable by wearing a helmet. 55% uh, were injured in the street, 33% on sidewalks, 33% had drank alcohol in the last 12 hours, I'm sure that shocks everybody, and 33% were injured on their <coughs> first scooter ride. And I, I put these out there because it suggests that there are some frameworks for potential regulation that might address some of the safety problems if that's a major concern for council. I think understanding this data better and understanding what our community expects better is part of the reason for doing a community engagement project. And so the motion that we proposed is to have um, this, to have you pass this emergency ordinance as, as provided in the packet. I have a question, it's probably for um, Kathleen or DK. Um, the proposed uh, motion um, talks about a nine month process and I, I agree with everything Tom said about community engagement. I know that's gonna be really important. We might have to get TAB involved. But do you think it would be possible to do this in a shorter period of time, and the period of time that I'd like to just throw out there would be before this council adjourns in November. So in other words, make the moratorium more in the range of five to six months. Do you think you can do the community engagement and the piloting that that you'd like to do in that time period? If we, if we could find room on our calendar in October, can you meet that? So, so yeah, please come up to the mic. And, and, um, Answer, please answer Bob's question. If we um, got TAB's involvement in big time. Great, great. Um, good evening, Kathleen Brackey, City of Boulder Transportation. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this evening. Um, it's a good question about the length of time to do the process. Um, We've really looked at this, and again, we've gone through similar processes regarding the dockless um, bike share, and then prior to that, the e-bike process that we went through as a community to look at some of these new forms of technology. And we just wanna make sure that there's enough time to do a robust process and make sure that we're able to reach out to all the different groups in the community, have the opportunity to work with TAB, work with the other boards um, and commissions of the downtown. So that is part of the um, recommendation around the, the nine months is just making sure there's enough time. If, this, if the desire of council was to do it in a shorter amount of time, we could rejuggle things and um, try our best to, to do that. The concern is just shortchanging it and not having enough time to get all of the stakeholders involved and have an opportunity to do the full robust process and to develop the regulations. That takes a, a process as well. There's a lot of 
um, changing information that's going on around the country in terms of best practice. We want to learn from that and apply it here. So it's it's having the time to do a well thought out and uh, robust process. So um, and there's lots of things happening at the same the same time too with the transportation master plan and a lot of the other projects that we're working on. So it's the same team working on these same projects, but we understand the importance of these new devices. We wanna be um, open and welcoming to new innovation, and, but we wanna do it in a way that also achieves the broader community goals for safety and um, respecting all of the different needs that we have. Lisa? Yeah, so we got a couple of emails from our, um, two of our TAB Transportation Advisory Board members, and they both stated that this came up at very late in the meeting, it wasn't on the agenda, I guess, and it was somewhat of a surprise to even be there. And so, on that agenda, um, and they both recommend against a moratorium and to get TAB much more involved. And um, so, what do you, could we do that? I mean, I guess I'm wondering why TAB was not brought into the process earlier since they are our transportation advisory board. So that's one question. And then two, could you involve them um, in a point that would help, to a point that would help accelerate this process and let them be mostly the body um, that is looking at this process? Sure, so um, I'll, there's two parts to that. I'll, a I'll answer both. The, um, it is very important to have TAB's involvement and engagement in this topic and all of our transportation topics. So, and there's a lot of um, items on TAB's agenda as well. Um, initially, this item was scheduled for the June TAB meeting as a, a full agenda item. Um, at that time, this item tonight was scheduled for the June 18th council meeting. Um, because of the state, the passage of the state legislation um, earlier in May, we needed to accelerate the time frame of this in order to be able to act quickly and bring this forward to you in a, in a timely manner. So at the May TAB meeting, um, I did provide an update to TAB under matters from staff, and I shared with them the memo that we provided for council. So all of this became very accelerated because of the um, quick action that was taken through the state legislative process. So we certainly do not wanna leave TAB out of the process. We welcome their input and their guidance in all of the work that we do, um, and we wanna continue to work with them on this going forward and having in-depth um, conversations and public hearings um, with them and also co-hosting um, public events with TAB. So we've talked about the importance of having opportunities for uh, community members to try scooters. There's people who never tried one and so how do we create a place to do that and how do we co-host that with TAB? So I think there's a lot of opportunities to work together. And, and then at the state level when this legislation was passed, what kind of process did they have? and? Um, did they adequately vet these safety concerns? So, and so can I answer? Yeah. Um, the, we were involved in the state process. This was mostly pushed by Denver to address some concerns that they had. So CML was actually supporting it. We tried to get a, a later implementation date to give us more time. We didn't get that. We basically couldn't oppose it because one of our colleagues was supporting it and CML, CML was supporting it. Um, so. We had, we had that, and, and it was passed on May 9th without an effective date. And generally, legislation like this has some date, uh, like usually July 1st, so that's mm -hmm. what we were anticipating. When it was passed without effective date, it becomes effective the day the governor signs it. And he hasn't signed it yet. So we, our original plan, as, as Kathleen said, was to bring this to council in June and have a, a thorough process before TAB. When it was, it was passed without an effective date on May 9th, uh, and then the governor could have signed it at any date. Uh, we thought it important to bring it forward with to council, and that was the advice we got from CAC as well. Cindy, Tom, isn't uh, wasn't one of the issues with Denver pushing for getting this done that the some of the companies came and unloaded uh, the scooters on the city before there was an agreement with the city about how they'd be used? I, I'm not really sure about all of the details, but I know that it was important for Denver to get the state to legalize the use in the streets for Denver's regulatory yeah. purposes. My so. Right, my understanding to a certain extent was that they were trying to get them off of the sidewalks and allow them to be in the streets. I think, I think that's right, that's what I've heard. Congestion and. So, uh, I, I, there was never, there, there was a plan to bring TAB in 
we kind of got a little sidetracked as we often are by the legislature. And again, this passed May 9th and we're here May 21st before you. So there wasn't a lot of time between that date and tonight. The, well, and the other, the other thing I'd like to say about TAB is that when we first talked about this sometime in the past, right, in terms of the, the scooters and I can't remember when that was, but there has been some notification to the city and to the boards that this is something that the council has been interested in, at least in terms of regulation, if not um, trying to get something scheduled. So it shouldn't, I don't think it should be a complete surprise because it has come before us before. So I'll call myself. I had a um, conversation with the Bird representative mm -hmm. and spoke to them about what they've seen in other communities, and it was pretty thought-provoking. Um, one of the things Denver has done is I believe that they have contracted to allow a handful of companies to, mm -hmm. to put scooters in, and they've capped the number per company. So there's an RFP process, and then you know they selected the more what they perceived to be the more responsible mm -hmm. operators, and then they've been gradually increasing the number of scooters that are allowed on the streets. And I wanted to ask about other micro mobility options. Like for instance, are skateboards legal anywhere in Boulder? So, uh, skateboards are really technically not legal anywhere in the right of way. Well, that, that's what, so I want to bring up the general micro mobility with this as a piece of it because um, I would like to see many micro mobility modes be treated like bikes. And I know that that's going to require a public outreach process and, you know, a conversation with bike advocacy groups as well. Yeah. But it doesn't seem to me, and as um, uh, Tom mentioned, we've started seeing more of these electric skateboards around as well. And those are clearly an option that some people um, have a preference for. And so I would like to see them with a legal place to operate. And if I understand correctly, skateboards in general and electric skateboards in particular don't have a place that they can operate legally. Is that correct? That's right. That's correct. Okay, and so as part of the, the public outreach here, it seems that anything that qualifies as micromobility, and I know we're worried about a particular business model here that is kind of becoming very popular and we want to get the regulatory structure in place, but as long as we are looking into this kind of thing, it seems like we ought to be able to be look at it for either private or rented other forms of micromobility. And it seems to me the most fair is to treat those like bicycles. And so are we having the discussion already? Because we're gonna have a we're gonna have a public hearing. Here. I wanted to just confirm yeah. that yeah. that that was correct about I'm sorry to go on, but I wanted to confirm that skateboards don't have a legal place to be that applies with electric skateboards as well. Right. Th that's correct. Yeah. And currently with scooters, yes. And okay, thank you. And, and Sam, the, of course, they could be on private property and they could be at skateboard parks, but they can't be, they can't be, they're not supposed to be using the multi use path or the sidewalks or the streets. Right. Theoretically, but right. we don't and really cite a lot of skateboarders. Yeah. And, and, and we understand the, the goal is to look at how can we structure an approach that would work for all, for all different types of new micro mobility options so that we're not having to come forward each time there's a new, a new, new version of something that, that we have. So I appreciate the okay. guidance there. So, so, uh, so um, yeah, so I have a question regarding um, the, um, you know, you, the, the staff member had a link to a video that was quite interesting. And um, in that video, they talked about, one of the things, talked about many things, but one of the things it talked about was the, um, um, the life and the disposable, the disposable um, feature, I guess, of the uh, these scooters. So I was wondering if, as part of the outreach and how this gets, um, this ordinance gets pulled together, mm -hmm. there's been any consideration of including it um, within the framework of the zero waste. Right, I, I think that's a really important um, component of this and information that we do need to consider as part of this. Um, DK has done the research again through with the city and county of Denver as well as their research sources around approximately 30 day uh, life cycle of a scooter. And so it is concerning from um, the durability and the zero waste approach. So appreciate that suggestion. Any other questions? 
No, but I, I, I do have one, and that is I would hope in, if, in this, whatever we end up doing, um, <clears throat> that we do look at these other components, skateboards. I mean, people are skateboarding all over the place, all other kind of micro mobility options. And the zero waste thing is really important. And as I understand it right now, these um, e-scooters are designed for like four hours a day, not 24 seven and uh, use. And so I'm wondering what kind of leverage we could use to um, require more um, uh, s um, stable um, machines that don't get thrown out every 24 days or whatever it is. Right, okay, thank you. We can definitely look into that. I, um, we have, that is part of this process is doing that research around what is out there what are the industry um, options and what could be done differently I here mean, than... You Seattle know, right is. now in, in e-bikes, those are made for the long term. Right, exactly. And so, you know, I don't know why there would be such a big divide between the scooters, the e-scooters and the e-bikes. So in terms of durability. Right, so there's, and there's a lot of different business models out there, and that's why we, we spent the time to develop our dockless bike share permit program so that we would um, incentivize the quality mm -hmm. um, bikes that are there and that are built for the long term versus there are uh, dockless bike shares that are very similar in terms of lesser quality mm -hmm. and um, don't have that durability there. So that was, again, part of um, how we approached it for those other items, but um, those are all things we need to look at as part of this work. No, that's great to hear, so thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Shall we do the public hearing? Matt. Yeah. Thank you. Not the budget, scooters. So my name is Matt Fromm, I'm, I'm a Boulder resident. I'd like to comment on the proposed electric scooter moratorium. I think it's a, a bad idea for a number of reasons and I would encourage the city to partner with private scooter companies to launch a pilot program this summer. While we have made progress on some of our transportation master plan goals, we are far behind on our goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector, our goal to reduce vehicle miles traveled from cars, and our goal to reduce single occupancy vehicle use. We need to do more to reduce our climate impact, get people out of their cars, and in the process, make our community healthy and more walkable. Electric scooters first came to market in late 2017 and quickly proved themselves to be a viable, clean transportation alternative to car travel, particularly for trips of five miles or less. These share scooters have a had a faster rise than bike share, car share, and ride share by far. It's a cheap and easy way to get around, and the average trip is, is less than $3. Now there are well over 100 cities that have scooters, and according to a populist report from 2018, 70% of the public support these scooters in their cities. Like other micro-mobility solutions, scooters fill in the gaps. They replace short distance car trips, and they provide first last mile solutions for potential transit riders. I have friends and colleagues that come to, to Boulder and fire up their bird scooter app uh, to look around for a scooter. Um, point being that this technology is already prevalent in other cities. It's a, an expected amenity, especially in a place like Boulder. Two months ago, the Fort Collins City Council approved an ordinance to allow electric scooters in their city. So the question is, why is Boulder so far behind? This is a technology that should have been invented in a, in a place like Boulder, and yet we are positioning ourselves to be a late adopter three years behind the curve. I'm frustrated because we should have put together a plan last summer, and now we're saying we need to wait until next summer to introduce scooters. My suggestion would be, uh, let's accelerate the process, launch a pilot scooter program this summer with a few, few rules based on best practices from around the country. Put a no scooter geofence around Pearl Street, paint a few scooter and bike parking boxes around town, set a 15 mile per hour speed limit, and require these companies to share their data for transportation planning purposes. This is also a great opportunity to partner with these private companies to fund public transit infrastructure. Portland applies a 25 cent per ride surcharge and uses that money to fund multimodal infrastructure. 
In addition, summer is the perfect time to launch an electric scooter program. The weather is warm, and there are, there are few, fewer students to put stress on the system. We've made incremental improvements to address this, but frankly, we don't have time to draw out these types of decisions. If we have any hope of reaching our climate and transportation goals, we must innovate, experiment, and be bold. Thanks. Yeah. Do you live in Boulder? I do. In which sector are you in, just as a matter of curiosity? I'm up on, uh, in Whittier. Yeah, I'm able to, Mapleton I mean, and 17th. I'm in, I'm in employment. Oh, I work in transportation, yeah. Um, okay. In fact, I testified on that bill on electric scooters, so. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Thank you. Andrea? Good evening, Andrea Menegel, representing the Boulder Chamber, 2440 Pearl Street. And um, the Boulder Chamber recognizes the, the opportunity scooters present uh, as an innovative multimodal option. Uh, the numbers are staggering. As Tom noted, last year in the US alone, we just saw 40 million trips happen. So we know it's coming, it's happening everywhere. And um, it's a, as a new form of micromobility, uh, as long as it's managed appropriately, planned, it could be a valuable tool for addressing our first final mile challenge, uh, as the young man who just went before me noted. So we appreciate the Boulder uh, Transportation Department's desire to innovate, and uh, we encourage the coordination between the operators and the city in order to get it right. But let's get there quickly. As uh, Council Member Yates just noted, as Council Member Brockett noted on the hotline today, um, let's move forward with regulations in a small pilot rather than imposing a lengthy moratorium. We're ready to support a pilot at the Boulder Chamber. We want to explore these opportunities with our businesses. We look forward to collaborating around those efforts and um, with uh, the city and other interested parties. And we want to just try something. Let's try 10 scooters, maybe 20. A uh, place like Boulder Junction or Flatirons Business Park where folks just need to get to some kind of food options. Let's see what they do. Let's see how they're used. And um, overall, we look forward to, to partnering on this. We look forward to continuing the conversation uh, about scooters and other multimodal options, because at the chamber, uh, we want to fully explore the possibilities to improve the mobility for our workforce and residents as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Cindy? I have a question. Um, Andrea, since you're with the Chamber of Commerce and yeah. you've been looking at these business models, do you have anything to recommend to the council regarding the modeling or the regulatory factors that would work so that it satisfies the community safety issues and mobility issues? Well, I, I think um, the memo that you got and the approach that the, the staff is taking is pretty good. You know, let's look at the best practices. Let's look at what's being modeled in other cities. Um, you know, a lot of other cities didn't get it right right away. City of Denver's had this, and uh, I think, you know, it took them a little bit to catch up to now where it's at. So as long as we do that kind of analysis, sees what's being done on other college campuses. I know Arizona State had scooters dumped on them and then quickly had to figure out what to do with it. Um, we can get there pretty quickly, but I think it's gonna be that focus and that initiative to see what's worked, what hasn't, working diligently with the operators to make sure that they come with responsible business practices and, uh, and figure out ideas and, and options like um, the gentleman before me mentioned on how we can uh, try something. But we don't have to go you know, crazy, let's just try something small, like mm -hmm. I said, just a few and, and see what they do and see how they operate. Lisa. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea. Um, so do you know what Fort Collins did in terms of a pilot or what process they went through? I don't know Fort Collins model specifically, but Kathleen, who lives there, may. <laughs> and or D David. And DK, DK is saying that he does. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah please. thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Dave Kemp, Senior Transportation Planner. Um, yes, we've been um, looking at several models across the U.S. and. Four columns right now, what they've done is um, they originally um, constructed a RFI, uh, mm -hmm. Request for Information. They had about 10 companies um, apply, and then they had a scoring sheet, and they were able to take the top three, and from the top three, they did an RFP, and from the RFP, they will select one operator for that community. Thank you. So, but, but now, do, can you ride e-scooters in Fort Collins legally? No, not right now. And so what kind of a pilot period or 
what are they doing? Well, I guess you can't do it anywhere because the state legislation hasn't gone through, right? Yeah, the, you know, they've done a lot of the same stuff that we're proposing mm -hmm. um, to some extent. Mm -hmm. uh, we're looking at a more extensive um, public engagement process that really vets the issues and concerns with all of our stakeholders in the community. Mobility for all, the local coordinating council, um, the downtown chamber, um, excuse me, the Boulder Chamber, the Downtown Boulder Partnerships. There are, you know, the interest in e-scooters is all over the board, um, whether they're a good thing or a bad thing. And I think it's really important that we really vet all these considerations and take the appropriate amount of time to do it well, so that when we do introduce a new program, the community is excited for it, and we've got a good set of regulations that we're ready to move forward with. And so um, getting people on these scooters firsthand in all different types of the season, whether it's summer and fall um, or winter, I think it's important for them to see what this is like year round. And so mm -hmm. bringing this uh, pilot program through um, the fall and into the winter is a great opportunity to see how these things really work in those different times of the year. So do you envision this pilot project starting? Um Tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah, and there are a lot of opportunities, I think, too, to work with the e-scooter e companies. We're not, a, we're not against e-scooters. We see this as a new form of transportation. Mm -hmm. It's fun, but there are some considerations that we need to really take a look at. There are safety issues. There are right-of-way concerns. And, um, but I think there's some ways in which we can really apply some innovative public engagement processes, like Andrea had mentioned, doing a small pilot program with a business park and seeing how that works, seeing how the geofencing technology works. And, and really taking um, kind of a more of a long term with focus groups um, in addition to public demonstration events to, to really get a handle and help the community really understand the impact, good or bad, associated with e-scooter use. So do you see these pilots though happening b during this moratorium? Yeah, but it, but in a contained manner. Right, right, right. Yeah, so, so you could have it at a business park. Or right, you could so what have we it. do is, so for example, if we were to choose a, a business park um, and we had, uh, say, we launched 20 to 30 scooters within this business park alone, we can geofence that area and see how well that particular technology works and how it's being used within the business park itself and, uh, and get a better understanding of how it, how it actually functions. So you're planning on doing that this summer? That's something we would like to explore. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And so I guess I'll formally close the public hearing now. If nobody else has signed up to speak, you can tell I'm a newbie. Um, so do we want to bring this back to council and have a discussion? Yeah. Yeah. I um, I really appreciated the um, the suggestions that came up during the public hearing from Mr. Fromer, um, in particular um, the surcharge to consider. A surcharge for that could be used for public transit. Um, also, um, a small pilot that was suggested by Andrea to, uh, in particular, at like 55th and Arapaho, to see if it is used um, for those kinds of trips. Because according to the data in the memo, those 38.5 million trips were done Friday afternoon through Sunday evening. So they were not getting used for last mile or any kind of um, commuting um, purpose. Um, and um, in addition, if we could take a look at what happens after the useful life of the scooter, what, what do these scooter companies do with them and maybe um, examine what make that part of a potential RFP, look at how do you dispose of them, um, and what are you doing to improve the life. Um, and I think that's all I have. Great, Cindy. So one of the things that I wanted to mention is that I think in terms of placing this moratorium while we work out the regulatory issues and hear from the public, um, has the benefit of seeing what other communities have done. Uh, San Francisco, for example, used the same kind of model that Fort Collins is and in, ended up having two smaller companies for its pilot programs, not Bird, not Lyft, not Lime. So interestingly enough, I, it's not until one goes through the process and can look at the what it is that the community wants and put the adequate regulatory pieces in place before we're just 
sort of swarmed with these um, scooters, I think is is a, a responsible way to go in terms of uh, just trying to look and see what others have learned. For example, there there's now a company, and maybe it is Bird, that's going docked so that they're doing a long-term rental. So there are all kinds of options out there, and it's really a moving, I think, um, industry as the industry itself is trying to conform more to what it is that the cities are trying to do and getting a hold of some regulatory aspect. So I would hope that we would, we would do something along those lines. Bob? I have a question, then I'll make a comment. Um, I guess this question is probably for you, DK. Um, in the memo on page 660, you refer to um, various demonstration events, which I think is what you were describing last time you wrote yeah. the microphone. Um, Andrea and our colleague um, Aaron Brockett used the term pilot, and so I wanted to make sure that we're all kind of on the same, regardless of whether there's a moratorium or not, I want to make sure that demonstration event and pilot were kind of all talking the same language because we're using different words. Sure, and there's there are actually two different things. Okay. The, the demonstration events would be more of a supervised um, mm -hmm. tour, if you will, um, you know, um, including different e-scooter companies to try out the different types of scooters they have, look at their technology, the interface with the mobile phone, and take people for a ride around the community on these e-scooters. And then the pilot program, which is also part of the public engagement program, excuse me, the public engagement process, um, would be more contained versus having it wide open for the entire community. So you, you'd do maybe demonstration first, and then if that went well, you might move to a pilot? Well, I, so I think what we could do is um, both concurrently. Okay. Yeah, we can get the more longer term understanding of how this would work in a, mm -hmm. say, a business park like Flatirons, um, while at the same time, we've got several demonstration events throughout the course of the year mm -hmm. to give people the opportunity to try these out for free firsthand, to see how they really work on our streets. So that's prompted a question that I want to direct to Tom. If, if we were to do these things, these demonstration events or pilots or whatnot, during a period of a moratorium, let's say we pass a moratorium tonight, do we need to carve that out of the moratorium? I don't think so. Uh, so. So the moratorium is just on issuing business licenses. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. It'd be administered uh, by the city. Yeah. And then we, we, we often do things that, that would, would be contrary to code and just don't enforce to allow for that. Got it. Like, okay. I don't know that you need to car carve out an ex Super. So I'll just make my statement now. Um, I, I would, given what, what DK and Kathleen have laid out, um, as far as demonstration events and pilots and all the great comments from the community and that I like your your um, add-on, Sam, that we need to investigate more than just electric scooters. I would be in favor of a moratorium. I thought I would never would say that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> this may be the first moratorium I voted for ever. Uh, I would be in favor of a moratorium just so that we are um, thoughtful and methodical about the process. Sounds like we've got a quick plan. It's going to be comprehensive. However, I would like to make it as short as possible. Um, I, um, we can always extend a moratorium. I mean, we can pick an arbitrary date and then we get to that date and we just haven't quite done our work. We can always extend a moratorium. I'm afraid if we have a long moratorium, we're going to fill this space. Right? We're, we're going to get the work done in the time that we give ourselves. So I'd like to shorten that up. And um, it's unfair to the next council to dump this on them in November, December. So the date that I'm going to throw out there is October 15th, which is the last the scheduled regular council meeting of this council. Um, there's a fifth Tuesday in October, October 29th, which we may or may not have a council meeting for, and then we're to the election. Um, so I'd like to propose um, that we do pass a moratorium, given all the, the great work that's planned. Um, try to get it done by October 15th. If we get to late September or October and it's not quite there, we can always extend it. Okay, I think I'll call on myself. Go ahead. Yeah. Um I think, uh, you know, in the past when we tried to accomplish something over the summer, what happens is a lot of people feel like they weren't included because they're gone over the summer. So I think that that kind of timeline presents that kind of um, issue with, yeah. So I, I guess I, I wouldn't be able to support that support for that reason. Um, yeah, so I would support the recommended more length of the moratorium. So I have a few thoughts. Um, I would prefer to see it done quicker as well, mm -hmm. but I, I figure w if the staff gets the work done earlier, we can always, you know, lift this. Another thought is that this is not a moratorium in any punitive sense. This is really to make sure that we have kind of holistically looked at micro mobility. 
that we uh, acknowledge that there are better and worse business models for the city and better and worse operators. And so this is an attempt to make sure that we're asking for what we want so that we get it m provided by, by whichever businesses will operate here. Um, so I'm going to support the full length of the moratorium, but I'm going to say to staff, if there's any way that you could get this done by fall, that would be fantastic so that we could then, because hopefully the pilots will teach us enough about how these are used that we can decide, you know, if we're good to go ahead with an RFP or however we want to handle it. So I'm going to support the, the full duration with the understanding that the goal is to make all of these micromobility options legal and, in my mind, treated as similarly to bikes as possible because I don't see why <clears throat> We, if as long as they're limited to 15 miles an hour, I'm not quite sure why we wouldn't want them on um, creek paths. Like my e-bike can go on the creek path, and so why wouldn't we want the scooter to be allowed to, to do the creek path as well? Or maybe it's a limited set of paths. But anyway, it's a conversation we should have. And so with respect to the speed on the, the scooters, it with respect to safety and looking at that aspect of it, it may not make sense that 50 miles per hour is pretty fast. Um, That's the limit on the creek path. Right, but it may be... It's one more it, mile. It's, it's one, it's one, well, it's, it's, I'm questioning the safety of having a scooter go that fast is, is all I'm questioning. And so to consider that um, as part of you know, the part of, of the outreach and research. Lisa? So, so I have a question, and I don't know, DK, or <laughs> on these e-scooters, is there a governor, or is there something that um, prevents it from exceeding X miles an hour? Yeah, the technology has, has actually come a long way since the advent of e-scooters. And today, um, you can um, regulate the speed of an e-scooter through a geofencing. Okay, so, oh, that's so, what you, okay. So for example, um, mm -hmm. multi-use paths and the 15 miles per hour, if we felt that there is a, a more appropriate speed for a multi-use path, that can be adjusted to fit that need. Could we do that with all our users? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to make some comments, and and so, um, can I? Or keep going. Yeah. So I would suggest you send as much of this and involve Tab in there as much as possible. They've been working on transportation, mobility, and things like that. And I think they have a lot of great ideas. Um, I like going, I agree with Bob, I think we need to accelerate this as, uh, maybe I shouldn't use the term accelerate, but that I would like to get this in, into our um, options of transportation um, as quickly as possible. I think the summer is a great time to be trying this out because the weather is warm and I would think in, in um, and I think as Mr. Fromer pointed out, the students are pretty much gone so we have kind of less stress. We do have people who come visit but it's a little mellower and I would think in summertime that would be at least a good time to start trying uh, e-scooter your skills on that instead of in the middle of winter. Um, I am concerned uh, with the waste uh, issue and would want to prioritize those companies that um, really make durable, long-lasting type e-scooters. Um, I'm also uh, curious in terms of where they're charging for their e and I don't want it to be, it needs to be a renewable source and not coal or something else. And um, I'd like to see it go as fast as possible. So I, I would like the October 15th, but I can also count. So um, I, I'm not sure I'm gonna be voting for this. I, I think we hurt ourselves by um, starting off with a moratorium instead of just phasing this in um, over a short period of time. And I guess if we could use different term terminology, I would prefer to just 
um, started as a phased in program where we're doing pilots, where we're doing demonstrations, where we're doing community outreach, getting people's input, doing it in really small allotments. And then um, phase two would be ramping it up. And I would prefer not to use the term moratorium, so. Are we ready for a motion? Sure. <clears throat> I move that we um, adopt on first reading, published by title only and by emergency ordinance 8326, providing time for the city to adopt regulations governing commercial electric scooter companies by prohibiting the city manager from issuing any business license to a commercial electric scooter company until February 4th, 2020, and setting forth related details. Second. Comment? Yeah. Um, I, I'm gonna support the motion. Um, like Lisa, I'd, I'd rather have it be done sooner, and I think we've told staff that we'd like it done sooner. I guess it happens when it happens. Um, I, I'm just worried a little bit about the headline here, because um, I think the headline says, you know, <laughs> yes, yeah, e-scooters banned from Boulder until February. And just to be really, really, really clear to the press that happens to be in the room, um, the only thing we're, um, we're not banning e-scooters, that's gonna be allowed by state law on city, city streets in a few weeks since the governor signs the bill. The thing that we're um, banning, I'll use that word, or instructing the city manager not to do is issue business licenses relating to scooters. That's the only thing we're doing. Commercial scooters. Commercial scooters. Yeah, business licenses to commercial scooter companies. So if somebody shows up, Tom, with a, a scooter of their own, after the governor signs the bill, they can ride it on the street, right? Okay. And can I ask a question? And will we be enforcing if people decide to take their lives into their hands or try to protect their lives and go on multi-use paths? And how would that be done? I, I don't know what the police department's plan is for enforcement. They'd have to put it in their enforcement priorities and they have Tom? lots of, I'm sorry, the police department would have to put it in their, among their enforcement priorities. And we've talked about how you would do that, but I'm not sure how much they'll do the enforcement. And they're not enforcing um, e-skateboards right now. I don't know that that's true, um, but I'm sure it's certainly not a police enforcement priority, no. Well, I've certainly seen a lot. So I'm gonna call on myself. Um, I very much um, agree with Bob that this is really a policy pause. Um, I'm excited to see scooter companies coming to Boulder. I think it's gonna be a good thing in the long run. I also think that we need to be really intentional and I think earlier on in this process, make sure that we legalize pretty much everything wherever we want it legal because you know there are privately owned <clears throat> mobility devices that aren't technically able to use bike lanes or use um, our multi-use paths and i think that that's something we should correct as a first part of this um, process not necessarily wait all the way to the end now business practices is a, a different thing right and so where do the dockless scooters get put where's the geofencing done you know all of that stuff but i can imagine an early phase where we just address the fact that we have illegal skateboards running around, which I think should be legal if people want to use them for mobility. So anyway, that's just one thought, is the earlier that we can change the ordinances to legalize things which might be operated by private individuals, the better off I think we'll be. So shall we take a vote? I, <clears throat> I'd just like to thank as well the transportation staff for the <clears throat> comprehensive um, nature of looking at this and the information that's been brought forward already. I think it's been really helpful. There's lots out there. And I think the more each of us who's interested in moving this forward looks at what has been done around the country and the world for that matter, um, we have lots to learn from others in how we move forward. Mary? So yeah, and I just wanted to, to, to echo um, Cindy's um, gratitude. And um, I wanted to just add another additional comment with regards to the outreach, to make sure that you outreach to the disability community, especially because um, I had the opportunity to be riding the Zero bus down Broadway um, in Denver a couple weeks ago. And the scooters were flying helter-skelter all over the sidewalks. And that makes it very difficult for somebody in a wheelchair or crutches, um, what have you, to navigate. So particular attention to that. Thank you. 
Okay. Right. Anything else? We, oh, ready to vote? Yep. Start with Council Member Weaver. Aye. Yates? Yes. Young? Yes. Carlisle? Aye. Morzell? Well, I don't know. I just think you <laughs> Probably not. The motion passes four to one. Your next item is a marijuana advisory panel update. Sam, would you like us to wait till you have a quorum? Okay. Oh. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, that's the same thing with each other. One more minute. One more person. Oh, I know. <laughs> Mosquitoes in the eyeballs. times. Almost exactly. <laughs> Suzanne, are we? Supposedly in 10 or 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. In theory, if her plane was on time. Yeah. So. Five people is keeps it down. All right, now we're good to go. Okay. This is an update on the marijuana uh, advisory panel and uh, Deputy City Attorney Sandra Yanis will be presenting. Sandra. Good 
Good evening, can you hear me? Um, so we're here to provide an update on the work uh, by the Marijuana Advisory Panel. And um, there are um, six items that uh, they provided recommendations on. And tonight I'm gonna be focusing mainly on the formation of a city marijuana board, um, but I'll also be touching lightly on some of the other topics. So um, the map is recommending formation of a city marijuana board. Um, and, and I will go into more detail on the specifics of what that looks like. Um, MAP is also recommending that c staff continue to seek feedback and provide updates with respect to the energy <coughs> impact offset fees, uh, business plan and its implementation. Um, MAP is recommending an additional one to two meetings to adequately address the issues regarding the penalty schedule and transfers issue. Um, staff will be providing council with an update after MAP uh, provides the recommendations regarding those two issues. And in fact, um, a subgroup met, a subgroup of MAP met um, last Friday and did a lot of good work. Um, that will be presented to the bigger MAP group on um, June 26th, I believe it is, Wednesday, um, where they'll have a discussion about that and come uh, come forward with a recommendation for council. Uh, MAP has also identified several new bills from the recent state legislative session um, that the potential newly formed board could address. Um, that is in attachment A. And lastly, the um, Department of Housing and Human Services provided MAP with an updated report uh, regarding substance education and awareness program. <clears throat> uh, in the first two years of that program, 2,238 adults and youth were served and participating subcontractors met 75% of the targets set for their program outcome measures. Um, the MAP recommended the city work to amplify the state of Colorado's good to know campaign, encourage safe storage, and mitigate concerns over impaired drivers. Um, the focus of the program um, on positive youth development and providing kids with alternatives to substance abuse is encouraging. With um, respect to, um, oh, hold on. Okay, so staff is seeking council direction on the following. Uh, first and foremost, MAP's recommendation to form a new city board. Uh, MAP's recommendation regarding the structure and responsibilities of that board. And uh, MAP's recommendation on the ongoing work regarding the penalty schedule in transfers by meeting for an additional one to two meetings. Um, lastly, uh, the new board uh, could address any state legislative changes that may impact Boulder continue to address the issue of in energy impact offset fees and any other marijuana related issue that council deems appropriate. <clears throat> With respect to the city board, um, the, um, the MAP formed, formed a subgroup that met twice in April um, for over two hours each time. And during that time, <clears throat> they were provided with um, the code and charters and a lot of information on how other city boards operate. In addition to that, um, we had two uh, BLA members come and speak and have them provide information on how the Beverage Licensing Authority works and um, provide some input and opportunity for them to ask questions. <clears throat> the recommendations that came out of that subgroup were brought forward to uh, the bigger marijuana advisory group. And um, it was recommended that the um, board be uh, advisory and quasi-judicial in nature, meaning that they would be addressing policy and licensing issues. <clears throat> that is very similar to what the Beverage Licensing Authority does now. Um, the difference being that um, because the um, liquor laws have been in place for so long, there's not a whole lot of changes or potential 
for, you know, advancements or whatnot. So it's pretty well established. Um, so the way that the BLA is now, it's 80% roughly licensing with about 20% policy. Um, with this potential board, the opposite would be true in the beginning in particular. Um, probably 80% policy with 20% licensing. Um, they have also recommended a phased in approach, which would mean that in the beginning, they would focus their work on policy work and advisory in nature, and um, <clears throat> they would work towards phasing in the license, licensing aspect of um, their role. With that happening, no sooner than six months and no greater than two years later. And the thought behind that was that they, feel, they felt like there were a lot of policy issues that really needed to be addressed um, more quickly and uh, it would also give them an opportunity to kind of get ramped up on the licensing aspect and learning the quasi-judicial nature of that aspect which can be <coughs> challenging. They uh, came up with a charter, um, which is um, pretty self-explanatory here, but uh, the, the charter reads, to promote the Boulder's, excuse me, to promote the Boulder community's interests and values in the local regulation of marijuana while considering the downstream consequences of such regulations on the community and on public health and safety while supporting economic <coughs> development and congruence between local ordinances and state laws. <clears throat> With respect to uh, its role in policy, um, the MAP has recommended that the board, if the council decides a, that a new board should be formed, um, that the board would address um, some remaining outstanding work from MAP. They had previously provided a letter to council in December of 2017 um, that had a list of items that they would have liked to had addressed, um, some of them being Title IX changes, um, marijuana social clubs, et cetera. In addition to that, um, one of the items that they addressed was um, questions of jurisdictional parity and also topics initiated by council um, the board itself, city staff, um, and also the public. And in terms of the public, um, the thought was that obviously there would be an opportunity for public comment with the board, um, but also there's already in place a mechanism where the public can provide input, uh, comments, and suggestions um, through uh, the suggestion, suggestion comment form um, through the licensing department. With respect to the licensing duties, um, obviously new applications, renewals, transfers, violation and penalty phase would all be aspects that the board um, would have purview over. Um, they uh, recommended that um, the board follow the same format that the BLA uses in determining whether or not a licensing matter is handled by the board or whether it's handled by uh, administratively by the licensing staff. And so um, with, in terms of the BLA, they came up with a form that um, provides some guidelines for uh, administrative staff to determine whether or not a particular matter would come in front of the board or not. So for example, on a transfer or a renewal or something, if there were issues uh, related to enforcement, uh, prior violations, or if there was um, complaints from neighbors and things like that, that would kind of raise a red flag, then those items would be brought forward to the board for uh, consideration rather than um, being uh, addressed administratively. So that's something that um, the new board could come up with a criteria for. We provided a sample um, in the packet, I believe it's attachment D, so that you can see what that looks like. Um, but all the licensing duties would continue to be handled by the city staff until um, the 
the board formally determines otherwise. So the phasing portion would be determined by the new board as to when they were ready to move on and address the licensing matters. Um, with respect to the makeup of the board members, uh, the map <coughs> recommended seven members, um, at least 21 years old. There was a lot of discussion about this. Um, uh, our code allows for um, anybody over 18, um, but they felt in the end that it was important for um, there to be someone who's of legal age to be able to participate or use the substance. And so um, there was a concern that, um, you know, there are other folks that are younger than 21 that might need it for medical purposes or whatnot. And it was determined that they would still have the opportunity to participate through public comment or whatnot, just not serve on the board. And then um, potentially ex officio members, um, the panel uh, decided to leave that uh, within the council's discretion. Essentially, um, what they recommended would is that the ex officio positions would be available for uh, anyone who is a non-resident from the ca candidate pool who would otherwise qualify under the uh, qualifications, but um, would be prohibited because they're a non-resident. In terms of um, the qualifications, they came up with a list of recommendations. Um, they're not requirements, uh, but simply um, suggestions on what they would kind of, what they would like to have in terms of qualifications, representation of the community at large, diversity, reflection of the community values, involvement in the education community, involvement in the public or mental health communities, involvement in a marijuana business, knowledge of marijuana laws and regulations, and involvement in other types of businesses other than marijuana. Um, at this point, um, I'd pose these questions for council um, in terms of the structure, um, and the options that uh, are being provided as recommendations. Um, the options are either that it be policy only, which would just be advisory, or the combination of policy and licensing, which the map is recommending. Um, whether or not you agree that the phase in of the, just, excuse me, the judicial role of licensing is appropriate, um, whether there should be five or seven members, map is recommending seven and whether or not the membership seats um, are designated or at large. Did you want to address those now? We can, I can keep going and we can do it at the end. Yeah, so let's, uh, this is not a um, public hearing, right? <clears throat> so it's a matter. So how would you like it, Sandra? We could do it either way. Um, this works for me if you want to provide comments or. Okay. Go ahead, Bob. Okay, I'll start off in, I guess, your first two bullets. Um, I guess uh, I've always been uncomfortable that our BLA, or our, our Beverage Licensing Authority, engages in um, the, if you divide, the, if you divide the, the task of the BLA and then also this proposed marijuana board into three buckets, you have policy, which is advice, um, you have licensing, and then you have enforcement, right? And I've always been uncomfortable that our BLA does enforcement. We, we hear a lot of complaints from, from community members that um, the BLA, as long as, as good as they are, and um, uh, doesn't have the uh, training, uh, judi the judicial training that may be required to make determinations, accept evidence, you hear witnesses, and so on and so forth. And it's my understanding that in a um, significant number of communities around the country and around Colorado, that um, license, license suspensions and other administrative, excuse me, other judicial determinations relating to uh, penalties and enforcement tend to be handled by municipal judges. Is that, is my understanding correct? 
I think that there is a certain, yeah, there's definitely a number of uh, jurisdictions that do it that way. I don't know what the breakdown is between boards and judges. Sure. It'd be something to be interesting to look at. But, um, and so I, I guess, uh, um, and, and we can revisit the BLA at some future date, but I, I don't want to make what I, repeat what I think is a mistake, and that is have lay people on a board making determinations with respect to um, enforcement. Um, and I think that also um, allows us to broaden the scope or the membership of the, of the, of the board, because if we have um, people in the industry, policing people in the industry, that's going to put them in a conflicted situation. If I'm a if I'm a, a grow operation or a, um, a, a, a retail operation, and another retail operation has been accused of a violation, I have an incentive, um, you know, and I don't know which that incentive, which way that incentive goes, but it's it's an incentive that I don't think we want as part of our enforcement process. I think we want a non biased. A party, and so uh, you'd almost have to have a, an organization that consists of people who are not in the industry, which I think then deprives us of industry experts from a policy standpoint. So I would very much like to not repeat the mistake that I think we have on BLA, and I don't want this board involved in um, in, um, in enforcement. Um, I, th I think it'd be interesting discussion in that middle bucket about licensing, and I'd like to, to have a little bit more of an exploration as this process goes through and hear from the staff whether they felt the demarcation between staff administration of licensing and the board licensing is the right place. Um, but I see this as largely a policy board, and I guess that's kind of where I'm at in those first two questions. So can I ask a question? <clears throat> What was the context of the recommendation that MAP gave? Because it seems like they wanted licensing involved with this board. Um, can you give some color on that? Yes, I, d I think that they wanted to be involved in the licensing aspect. And um, in terms, I think there was some concern uh, initially that the licensing responsibilities would be so overwhelming that they wouldn't be able to handle the policy aspect. Um, but I think that they tried to address that with the phasing in um, strategy. And, um, you know, I think that there was also some discussion about enforcement as well. And um, I do know that. Um, from the perspective of um, the BLA members that spoke to the subgroup, they shared that it was beneficial to them to uh, be able to not only hear from applicants on new applications and renewals and so forth, but also to hear um, the enforcement details. Um, because it gave them a better picture of what was going on in the community. Um, having said that, um, they also talked about other options where um, staff could provide uh, a report on a regular basis of um, not only uh, applications that didn't go in front of them um, that were you know, process administratively, but maybe also enforcement. Okay, thank you. Lisa? Well, I'm just going to answer um, questions. Uh, and I guess I would like to see a combination of policy and licensing. And I like, I actually like the phasing in over time. Um, I don't, Bob, understand. Um, a lot of the enforcement issues with um, BLA, but I think this, the MAP group deliberately said they wouldn't even start licensing until like at the earliest six months and not until like no later than two, two years, something like that. So I think it gives them a little, um, ability for, or time to, um, get their feet wet and to understand, and I think right now, um, policy on marijuana is changing rapidly at the state level and will be <laughs> probably changing at the federal level, level. And I think having a board 
um, in uh, seated that can address those policies will be very important. And so I, I really appreciate the phase, phasing in. Um, I, I would keep it right now as, at an advisory por point and let um, our administrative staff continue with their, their job of licensing and stuff. And I would encourage um, our staff, and I'm sure they have a lot of interaction right now with MAP, but I would encourage them to have sessions with MAP and talk about some of the challenges that they've come across in licensing and um, surprises during once the MAP board is, is seated. Um, I would want seven members rather than five in order to give as diverse a group as possible. Um, if you look at the attachment C and you look at who right now is on the um, map, you have everybody from CU to public health to um, industry people to BVSD. You have a broad range of people, and I think you want to keep that diversity of perspectives. And so I don't know how you would write that into the board language in terms of um, making sure you do have this broad diversity, because I think a lot of people are interested in this, and I think you want people from a variety of perspectives to be creating the policies and to be also looking at new policies coming in from the state and the federal level. And with respect to membership seats designated or at large, I'm open to a discussion I, and I'll just wait and see what others think. Um, I think, it, I don't know, I mean, if the group that we have here is good. I think it would be good to um, kind of replicate this this group, or you know, the diversity of perspective. I jump the queue. Just I just want a definitional because we're we're kind of throwing around the words licensing and enforcement mm -hmm. almost a little interchangeably. And I guess I I'm going to throw out a definition of licensing, and you tell me if it's wrong or not. I guess I, I consider licensing as granting new licenses and approving transfers of licenses. And enforcement, I would consider, is taking away a license or otherwise imposing penalties. Yeah. I just want us to be clear about licensing versus enforcement. Mm -hmm. Is that a definition that we can work with tonight, or how would you define the difference between licensing and enforcement? That's fair. I mean, I think there's probably a lot more licensing involved than just the ones that you mentioned. There's mm -hmm. a lot of different things that uh, can require an, an application or administrative review, um, but I think that's a fair statement. And, and also, just to, to share with you, with respect to the enforcement, um, the way that it currently is right now, um, decisions on um, violations and penalty are um, decided by the licensing clerk, and then there's an opportunity for appeal to the municipal court, mm -hmm. and then there's an additional appeal review uh, to district court. Great. And so what would quasi-judicial licensing be then? Give us an example of that. So yes, quasi-judicial licensing would be um, really any time um, there's a, a new application that it requires public input. So um, the, the way that the BLA does it every time that there are, you know, new license applications, transfers, renewals, there's an opportunity for public comment. And so it becomes um, more of a mini hearing trial kind of thing where, um, you know, the applicant provides information, presents their case. Um, if there's anyone there in opposition, they have an opportunity to, and then the public as well, and then there's deliberations by the board. So I'm sorry, I, I don't want to belabor the point, but I want to make it real clear here. So I, so that's fine, that, I get that, that's an, aff like an affirmative licensing, either the granting of a license mm -hmm. or or maybe the transfer of a license as a public hearing, so that makes it quite judicial. But um, the BLA in, in, is involved in enforcement and penalties, is that correct? Yes. And is the proposal here that the 
Marijuana Advisory Board be involved in that same type of enforcement or penalties? Yes. It is, okay, because it's not on your slide, that's why I'm, I'm confused. Well, so I guess I, d I consider enforcement part of licensing. Asset because okay. it's quasi-judicial, they're both quasi-judicial. Okay. okay, well let, let's maybe set aside the the, the quasi-judicial component of it, the fact that there's a hearing and mm -hmm. maybe that kind of stuff, but can we, can we for t tonight's purposes, so we can answer your questions, separate licensing from enforcement? Maybe they want all three parts. Maybe they want policy and licensing and enforcement, but we keep drifting into blending enforcement and licensing, and I'd like to make that distinction. That's fine, we can do that. Okay. I, I, that wasn't a distinction that we made. Okay, but they do want to do, yeah. they do want to do enforcement eventually, is that right? Yes. Okay. So, Mary, oh. well, so you're not done? I wasn't done. Oh, that's oh, right. So just just back to uh, I think um, to phase in the li licensing um, or enforcement I think is a wise thing um, because um, one thing I learned today well I knew that the medical marijuana um, is going to cease in 2019 and we have something like 85 pages of code with respect to marijuana. And I think, you know, half of it might be related to medical marijuana and half of it may be related to recreational. And it's just, it's. I don't think it will be as easy as just wiping out the medical marijuana yeah. code and saying, okay, now we have the um, recreational marijuana code because we'll still have medicinal marijuana and we'll still have, as you mentioned, people 18 or under 21 who um, would have access to medical marijuana. So I think um, a, pro a time to really consider those policies and the changes of those policies and the changes in those codes would be very important, so. Mary? So I had some questions with respect to the staffing. Um, so um, in the memo, um, it said that uh, that creating a board is going to require increasing um, marijuana application fees, subsidization from the general fund of marijuana licensing, or relying on marijuana tax revenue. Um, is there a, any reason why? Um, we wouldn't just rely on the marijuana tax revenue since it is gonna, we heard earlier tonight that it's gonna become ongoing. Mm -hmm. No, that's a policy choice for council. Um, there's something in our code, I'm sorry. It's a policy choice for council. There's something in our code that says that um, marijuana should be basically uh, subsidized, cover, uh, exp expenses should be covered by fees like we have um, self-sustaining for other parts of the government, but there's no reason why council couldn't decide to use marijuana tax funds for those things. And is that something that you want feedback from us tonight? No. Or is that going to be during the budget? That would be the budget process. Okay. It, we'll make those decisions on it, on budgeting questions based on what council does with the board. Okay. And um, and so there was another um, mention of a necessary FD for the city attorney's office. And so my question is, earlier tonight also in the adjustment to base, there was a set of um, staff that was recommended by the work, the internal working group that Jane mentioned. And so how does that relate to this staff that is um, described here? So I, I believe that, and Michonne can correct me, that's for the current work to bring the staff up to speed for what we're currently doing. The budget proposal would be based on additional work that might be necessary if we have a quasi-judicial board. So uh, we, the, for the city's attorney's office, we decided not to ask for anything until we see this. I think we can handle our current workload. It, my plan is if you do create a, a board to ask for an additional attorney who would be a marijuana specialist, as you all know, seeing Sandra and Kathy and me and other people do this work, we've sort of spread it out among existing workload. I think as we develop, if, if you have a board, it would be nice to have an attorney who specializes in marijuana and does pretty much only that, who's funded at a marijuana tax funds. Um, but that, that's a budget discussion that we'll uh -huh. propose as part of the budget process, and it will depend in part on, on how this board is structured. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see if I have any additional questions. Um, 
And I guess I'll go through the questions as well. Um, yes, um, on the policy um, and licensing combo. And then f I like the phasing in as well, um, the seven members. And then the, the membership, membership designated or at large, I think there's more than seven members on the on the map right now, aren't there? Yes, there's. Yeah, so so to have that same kind of representation with seven members would be difficult. So it seems to me that like um, we might want to desi designate, and this is a, a question to my colleagues, to designate um, some of the seats and have some of them be at large, um, and and have some like you have to have some knowledge of marijuana laws and policy would, might be one that is designated. Um, and I haven't thought this through, but some combination of designated and at large to ensure that you always have some fundamental basic um, knowledge within the board. I uh, basically agree with what Mary has just said. The policy and um, licensing, phasing in the quasi-judicial seven members, and I think the designated seats are also a good move to be sure that there is some continuity in those who are really familiar with the topic, subject. So, can I? So do you mean, um, all the seats designated, or no? Some designated, some, and at some large, designated. right? Okay. And and maybe the board itself could make suggestions about how that works, or the map could do that, mm -hmm. not the board. Okay, so I'll call on myself. Um, <clears throat> I generally agree with the combo of policy, licensing, and enforcement. Just to be clear, um, all under this. Board, I might call it the Marijuana Licensing Authority just for parallelism with the BLA. Um, I agree with my colleagues that phasing it in is a good idea. So leaving that to the discretion of the board as to what the pace of that should be. I think seven members is what I would lean towards for more diversity. Um, I could see Mary doing two designated seats that are industry focused, maybe two that are health or substance abuse focused, and then three at large, something along those lines. I would take the advice of the um, marijuana advisory mm -hmm. panel um, on that, but I, I think some mix of people who have the different expertise that we're hoping that the board will bring. And uh, yeah, I think, you know, I'm not sure, Bob, that I've heard that much uh, negative about the BLA. And so I think having a quasi-judicial board of intelligent and concerned and knowledgeable people is a, is a good way to go if, if our goal, in fact, is to treat marijuana like alcohol, as we have said, kind of from the get-go, then I think in the long run, having the board members of both the BLA and the MLA, if that's what it is, look at how um, penalties are handled and trying to make them parallel between marijuana and alcohol. Bob? I, I think absolutely from a policy standpoint that we should have parallelism on, on the penalty schedules and so on and so forth. I continue to be uncomfortable with taking the enforcement responsibilities away from the staff and the municipal judge, which is where it resides right now. Um, there's a whole lot, we have a whole lot of laws in this city and all of them except for liquor are handled by our municipal judge. And so I don't know why we're carving out um, this particular set of enforcement and handing it to some non-trained, non-judge people and, ha and, and particularly if they're in the industry where they're gonna be policing themselves. So I think we need for consistency's sake um, that enforcement be handled by staff and the municipal judge which is the way all of our other laws are, are handled in this city with the exception of liquor. I would appreciate it when this comes back if the staff could do a bit of a, um, some benchmarking and some analysis about what other cities are doing, um, certainly with alcohol because there's a long history there, so it would be pretty easy to track down what, are, what, are, what other cities are doing on alcohol. Is it, is it a residence board that's doing enforcement or is it um, staff or a judge? And, and to the extent that there are cities that have ventured into enforcement are they doing this with a judge or are they doing it with um, some untrained um, residents? So I, I'd, I'd appreciate whenever you come back on this to, to see what other cities are doing. 
Cindy. So I'd like to follow up. I wasn't thinking clearly when I was talking about the quasi-judicial role. I think Bob makes a good argument about keeping this before the municipal judge, particularly because of the possibility of conflicts. And um, it just makes it cleaner. So I would like to see that followed up as well. Okay, Lisa. So I have a question, and Tom, maybe you can answer this. Um, in our liquor um, licensing, in our BLA, I mean, liquor is controlled by the state, isn't that? Liquor laws are controlled it's by the state? It's a dual licensing system, so it's handled by the state, and then locals have authority. Right. So, um, As is do, what, pardon me? As is marijuana. Marijuana is dual licensing. Right, so how do other communities handle their BLAs, or their, not BLAs, but their so you recall, You're the only one who was here, but mm -hmm. we took a look at this back in 2013. And most of the communities in this area, uh, Longmont, Greeley, Fort Collins, Colorado Springs, Denver, have a hearing officer that's either the municipal court or independently appointed. And okay. I was just reading my memo, I actually referred to the Magna Carta in there. So it's actually great literature. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and, but we don't have a hearing officer. No. no. So we could address some of Bob's concerns, uh, maybe not completely, if there was a hearing officer that's somewhat independent of that board. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. For the judge. So I think um, maybe we need to come back to this when we have a full council. Mm -hmm. So um, <clears throat> we can give our thoughts now, but I also think that we'd like some other people to weigh in as well. So I just wanted to um, just make one more comment regarding the list of um, legislation that just passed. Yes, I actually have some more slides. Oh, you do? Okay. Do. <laughs> <laughs> never, never have one ask questions in the middle of the presentation. <laughs> All right, here we go. All right, um, with respect to the penalty schedule and transfers, um, MAP is looking for direction on, on whether they can have an additional one or two meetings to continue to address this issue. Um, we had a smaller subgroup meet on Friday. Uh, we did a lot of good work and that information or rec their recommendation will go back to the bigger group um, on June 26th, I believe. Um, and um, so, yeah, that's kind of where it is now. Where so the the topics are, you know, whether or not you know, transfers, uh, whether or not violations get transferred to a new buyer, um, and then more specifically, the penalty schedule, fines, suspensions, days in abeyance, revocation, all the things that BLA takes into consideration now. Um, currently, uh, marijuana um, penalties are mostly fines, uh, consideration of fines. We don't use suspensions or days in abeyance. Is that correct? Okay. And so just wanting to some d uh, direction on whether or not uh, council is all right with that. We're continuing yeah. to do this work. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so I, I think MAP should continue, um, and I would give them two additional meetings for discussions and future recommendations on the pe penalty schedule and transfers. I think part of the problem I've heard is that they, you know, the meetings are X amount of time, and sometimes there's more topics that they would like. They're to. usually three hours long. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's pretty significant chunk of time on their part. Right, right. So, so so anyway, I mean, if it's one or two, I'd rather give them two additional meetings. I think they should continue, and I think um, we'll continue, and it sounds like we're pretty unanimous here, at least in going forward and setting up a, a MLA or some kind of an advisory board. I think the hope is that we could get it done within one meeting. Um, the request for two is if we were to run out of time, but uh, certainly the goal is to try to get it done quickly. Yeah, I mean, if you get what you need to get yeah. done, done, then great, but 
I want to make sure that those people who have also invested time on MAP um, feel the same way. Okay. I support one or two meetings, yeah. So continuing just so that we can flesh it out. And if you wouldn't mind getting um, some clarity from them on are they comfortable doing enforcement? Because I think sure. it's, it's really, you know, when this comes back to council, I think we wanna make a firm decision on whether we do a BLA type group or not. <laughs> Um, in terms of the recent um, changes at the state level, um, none of the, um, the new laws conflict with our code. However, um, several MAP members expressed an interest in pursuing discussions of these new laws, and uh, the suggestion or recommendation would be that it would be on the work plan for a future board. Okay, good. Um, again, does council agree with taking that approach? Yes. Anybody disagree, Mary? So I have um, just uh, some questions regarding the um, the new legislation. Um, actually, it's more like comments. Um, it's my understanding that some of them actually do create some, um, perhaps not conflicts, but attention that must be given to them. For example, um, the um, HB 191230, um, the hospitality establishments, which creates a new license, so that has to be addressed. Um, the marijuana delivery um, is an endorsement to a license, so that might need some attention. So there's several of them like this, and I'm wondering if one of the things, um, whether it would be first order of business for the new board mm -hmm. to take a look at all of these and look at which ones do indeed or do not affect our um, ordinances and then s prioritize them. That seems like a first order of business um, because some of these will be on a timeline. So that's my comment. And yes. Any, anyone else have any comments on this one? I mean, generally, this is a yes. The other thing I would say is, uh, I'm yes on this, um, I think maybe if we had to do it all over again, we probably would do things a little differently with respect to the housing board. I don't think we provided them with sufficient guidance when mm -hmm. we launched them a year or a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. And I just wanna make sure that we don't make the same mistake yep. here. So if this board gets formed in the next six or 12 months or whenever it is, I think in addition to his charter and all these things in this work plan, we, we need to be really specific with the board about what we mm -hmm. ask them to do rather than saying, go forth and I agree. do policy um, and, and so that they know what, what we expect of them. Mm -hmm. Good point. Okay, anything else? That's it. Okay, super. Any final comments from council? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Your next item is citywide retail study mid project update. So Sarah Wiebenson is gonna be presenting this and we will, oh, here we go. So, Sarah. Thank you. Um, this is a midpoint update on the citywide retail study. We were last before council in July, getting input on a scope of work for the project. Since then, considerable work has been completed by members of the community, working with our nonprofit economic vitality partners and an interdepartmental staff team to examine the Boulder retail environment and whether Boulder residents, workers, and students are able to meet their needs for basic goods and services within Boulder. Tonight, we'll review the purpose of the study, where we are within the four study phases, and next steps. 
We will focus on what is known at this point, which includes basic data on the Boulder retail environment, who we were able to reach with our community engagement efforts, and some preliminary themes from those responses. We'll come back this July with a more complete analysis of the study findings and recommendations for next steps as we develop a citywide retail strategy. I'm going to run through the slides fairly quickly um, and then we'll follow with questions for council given the late hour, try not to take too long. So first, the study follows last year's downtown retail vibrancy study by looking more broadly at the retail environment in Boulder and assessing whether it meets the community's core values, such as sense of place, welcoming, inclusive, and diverse, sustainable, and environmental stewardship. The study will ultimately inform a citywide retail strategy to help us achieve the comprehensive plan goals of a more vibrant retail environment, as well as supporting maintaining affordable retail space. With the data collection phase now complete, we are at the midpoint of the study. The work so far has included hiring a consultant through a competitive bidding process to assist with survey design, analysis, and recommendations. We worked with our nonprofit community partners to develop an engagement plan and collected more than 1,000 responses to three questionnaires, one for shoppers, one for retailers, and exit interviews with retail operators that have closed or relocated from Boulder within the last two years. We are currently analyzing the questionnaire responses and evaluating these in light of broader quantitative data collection being conducted by the consultant. By July, we will have a final report and recommendations for how to pursue the citywide retail strategy based on the study findings. The study looked at the Boulder retail environment, both citywide and within what the consultant identified as 10 primary nodes of retail activity. The entire retail environment is 6.6 .6 million square feet, which generates 2.9 billion in retail sales in 2018. Both the total, total square footage and sales are higher than any of Boulder's neighboring communities, and more detail on these comparisons is provided in the agenda packet. The shopper and retailer questionnaires and exit interviews were designed to reflect the community values that make up the framework for the study. In the analysis phase, we were able to determine um, if some responses are more common in certain areas of Boulder or among certain Boulder demographics, and how our retail performance compares to our neighboring communities and peer communities nationwide. The survey also looked at how people access retail areas, both to work and to shop and what characteristics of a retail district are important to them. We asked about how shopping behavior is changing, if at all, and whether they are buying more goods online, remaining within Boulder, or looking outside the community. The staff team on the project includes a member of the city's engagement team. They assisted with strategies for reaching community members from a broad variety of backgrounds. Postcards and mailers with survey links were sent in both English and Spanish, we conducted in-person outreach at various public events, at Boulder Housing Partners and at the Emergency Family Assistance Association. Surveys were conducted door-to-door -door using the Community Connector Program, and we reached out to bilingual school-age families using the Families and Educators Together Program. We also conducted in-person visits to more than 100 retailers across the city and worked with the Small Business Development Center to conduct confidential in-person exit interviews. The goal was to reach a broad geographic and demographic diversity of responses. Over the next few slides, we'll illustrate the reach of the community engagement effort. All of the graphics are available in the agenda packet, which is posted online for a more readable format. This presentation provides a quick overview of the information that's been gathered. The geographic distribution of responses from resident shoppers, worker shoppers, and retail retailers reflected fairly closely where the residents, workers, and retail activity were taking place. The demographic distribution of responses was more varied. Respondents were from a wider diversity of age groups and in income levels. However, respondents had less diversity in their self-identified ethnic groups and genders. How the response rates match up to Boulder demographics overall will be examined in the analysis phase and statistical findings may be weighted accordingly. Business respondents represented a mix of retail, restaurant, and service businesses, 
More than half had fewer than 20 employees and more than half only had locations in Boulder, reflecting a significant response from small and locally owned businesses. We had a higher rate of um, responses among restaurants in the exit interview outreach, although these also were primarily were smaller sized businesses and more than a third had been in Boulder for more than 21 years. At this stage, the comprehensive analysis of the survey data is not yet complete. However, staff has reviewed more than 800 open-ended responses to the surveys and highlighted the comments that appeared more frequently. The shopper survey responses, for example, included multiple requests for a greater diversity of retail, including more general merchandise op options and location-specific needs such as grocery stores in certain areas across the city. Some respondents reported shopping more frequently outside of Boulder since the introduction of the sugary beverage and bag fees. Respondents frequently said they felt the need to go outside Boulder to access affordable goods at stores such as Costco and Walmart. Current retailers responded that they located in Boulder because of the beauty of the location and because of the relatively affluent customer base. They also liked that the city offered a mix of resident, student, and tourist customers. Some found it challenging, however, to adequately park their customers and employees and to navigate the city's zoning and permitting processes. Some also said they would like support for workforce housing and for reducing potential negative impacts from people who are homeless locating outside their stores. Comments from businesses who closed their Boulder locations were fairly similar to those still in operation. More of these respondents cited issues that arose from not owning their building, such as rising rents, building maintenance issues, and pass-through costs. Some of the closed retailers also cited a perceived negative impact from marijuana-based businesses. <coughs> as mentioned earlier in the study, we are at the midpoint. When the analysis and final report are ready in July, we will return with next steps for developing the citywide retail strategy. The strategy will be how we pursue the comprehensive plan goals of a vibrant retail base and supporting affordable commercial space within the context of the city's core values. The next few months may also include additional community engagement as needed. Our questions for council tonight focus on whether council has any questions or comments at this midpoint in the project, as well as whether council wishes for staff to focus on any particular areas as we proceed into the final stages of the project. Great, thanks very much, Bob. Do you, thanks, that was helpful, nice and short. <laughs> um, do you anticipate that the final report um, or the recommendations later on will have um, things that are actionable by the city council? In other words, do you, maybe if the answer is don't know, that's okay an answer too, but do you anticipate that you're gonna ask us to do certain things relating to taxes or land use or zoning or things like that? In other words, is this informational and then we're, you know, we're all gonna kinda go out there and encourage good things to happen? Or are we gonna like legislate things to happen? I think at this stage it's too soon to know what any policy recommendations would be. Okay. Um, where we're at is starting the analysis to determine what people's goals and objectives might be for that strategy. Okay. And then the strategy would actually begin to develop the actionable items, and out of that may come some policy changes. Okay, thanks. It's deemed appropriate. Anyone else? Any other questions? <clears throat> I, I, sir, I appreciate um, this and it was short and sweet and I, it was very complete I thought so thank you thank you all. yeah and the memo was quite good it had lots of good information in it so I think this is on track and I think it will reveal some interesting things for us what I find interesting um, in the report was how well we are doing mm -hmm. and um, earlier in the year there was this headline that we were failing or flattening or whatever, but um, things have returned to or uh, weren't as gloomy as they had been predicted. And we're still very strong in the um, marketplace and in, in the region, so. Can I echo that? Um, one number that jumped out at me um, was the fact that the average, that the retail sale per capita 
in the city was $27,000. In other words, you take all the money that people spend in the city and divide it by the number of people in the city, it was $27,000 per capita. Yeah. If you do the math on that, our, our, our city's share of the sales tax is a, almost 4%, it's like 3.8% or something like that. So that's roughly, roughly, um, I guess what it, the point I'm trying to get to is, our budget is about $3,000 per capita, okay, $3,000. If you take the, our overall budget of 300 and some odd million divided by 108,000 people, it's roughly $3,000 per capita that we spend on everything. That includes our utilities, by the way, too. If you do the just the retail portion of that, the sales tax on the retail portion of that, most of which is probably taxable, um, that's $1,000. In other words, my point is, is one-third of our budget comes from retail sales. One third of our overall budget comes from retail sales. So we can, um, I guess what I can say is, that's why I asked the question about, are we gonna legislate? Because we could really screw that up, right? We could do like something that inadvertently causes that to go down because we're way higher than a lot of our cities in the, in the front range on a per capita basis in sales. And so while, um, you know, it, it, you know, money is not the be all end all of, of city government. We have to keep in mind that city government is funded and all the wonderful things we have as far as our parks and our paths and our open space and so on and so forth is a big, big portion of that is funded by retail. And we, um, we need to be very intentional about what we do to that. Do we want to grow it? Do we want to preserve it? Or do we want to reduce it? And if we, if we reduce it either intentionally or unintentionally, we just really need to realize that really is going to have an impact on our budget, which has an impact on the services we can provide. Okay, thank you, Bob. Lisa? Yeah, I had one question I probably should have asked earlier, and it, it goes to your figure two, it's a table, and um, you have um, population. What's that population refer to? Is it population that frequents that? shopping center? Is it population that lives in the, what is that? Sure, yeah, figure two is um, describing um, everything within a three quarter mile of our retail nodes. So the population is just the resident population within that radius okay. of that node. So if you're thinking about a, a trade area for a commercial district of who might be walking and supporting that district, it just gives you an order of magnitude of the population density surrounding each of those nodes. So, so that, <coughs> when I was looking at all of these, what really jumped out at me was the high population at the Hill. Mm -hmm. And almost 19,000. And it's one of the highest, it's the second highest after Basemar. And so that's why the note is in there, that it includes portion of campus as well. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it has a high population density. So you would think the retail would be doing better at the Hill. One would hope. Yeah. One would hope. <laughs> Cindy. So in terms of following up on Bob's question about actionable items, one of the things we did earlier today was interview for an applicant for the Bura board and Diagonal Plaza was mentioned again. So uh, perhaps in terms of retail, the things that people say who live here that they want and that they go out of town for, possibly there might be some options that we would be able to look at in terms of expanding mm -hmm. those kinds of needs in some of the more vacant commercial lands that we have, those that could be done, made over, so, so to speak. Yeah. Okay, anything else? Thank you very much. Well, see you in July. <coughs> Thank you, sir. Okay, we have three more small things. Do you want to talk at all about the Board and Commission appointments or completely postpone the whole well, item? Let's just confirm. Um, so I, I think it would be best if we did uh, Board and Commission appointments with mm -hmm. the Fuller Council than we have tonight. So I would propose that we table this until the next full meeting. Agreed. Sure, yeah, maybe CAC can just put it on for June 4th. And we already uh, deleted it from the agenda, didn't yeah. we? Yeah. <laughs> So, um, okay, there's that. And then police oversight task force amendments. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, I'll take that one since Aaron's not here. Um, so, one of the things that was in the charter for the, um, the task force was um, 
representation. And um, I think all of us on the subcommittee wanted um, Latino representation, and we thought that we had that. Uh, we made some assumptions, and as it turned out, we didn't. Um, so um, Aaron and I spoke on Sunday, and um, we proposed that um, we reopen the applications for one week. And, um, and ask council to um, authorize the subcommittee to appoint that person who would then um, become the 13th member and that way that person could be available for the first meeting on the 31st. Bob. Thanks for that, Mary. Um, just a question, um, just two questions. One. I seem to recall from when when uh, your committee was making a recommendation to council, as it was two weeks ago, there was, had been some scoring of of the candidates. Yeah. Um, can you could you use the scoring that you've already done um, on the people that already applied and identify the thirteenth person? Um, there was one person that we talked at length about that I was advocating for, mm -hmm. who was Latino, mm -hmm. um, but the committee did not support that person. Yeah. Um, so um, Aaron and I spoke about that, and um, and so we agreed that it would was probably better to just reopen it. Reopen, that's fine. Then second question is, um, you'll reopen, it'll be open for a while, people will apply, and then is it gonna be all five of you that are gonna look at those new applications? Yes. Okay. That meeting would be public and noticed? Um, well, it's two council members. Yeah, but if it's if council's delegating authority to a committee, then the committee has to act, comply with the Open Meetings Act. Okay, well then I guess we would have to make it open and public and noticed. So I have a few logistics questions. The first meeting of the task force is May 30th, which is a week from Thursday. <clears throat> um, and your next meeting of council is next Tuesday, but I guess is the task for, I, I guess I am the one or my office is the one that needs to reopen it by providing a press release, by sending an email to all the people that already applied but didn't get selected, um, by gathering all the materials. So by when do you want the materials gathered and when can you meet in order to review them so that the folks can show up at the first meeting. We didn't quite establish the timeline, so thank you for asking that. Um, it is a tight timeline, and if it needs to, um, if that 13th person needs to miss that first meeting, which is highly likely that would happen anyway, mm -hmm. because it would be very, very short notice. It would be really short notice for that. So, um, so uh, what is your suggestion? <laughs> in terms of, you know, reopening it, it can, how much of the previous materials can you use? Um, so, so certainly we can use all the previous materials, except that since we're reopening it, we need to ask people if they still want to be considered. Mm -hmm. Because some folks might no long, might not qualify. Well, we would be reopening it, we would be reopening it with a, um, a requirement that they be Latino, because um, a lot of the people that previously applied were not, except for this one person that the committee did not choose to appoint. So um, I guess I would ask my colleagues to see if they have an alternate suggestion. I do, um, um, I know it's this is dangerous, but um, you spoke, sounds like you spoke pretty highly for the Latina uh -huh. person that applied. Uh -huh. Was Aaron relatively favorable on that person as well? Um, I don't think he really weighed in on that person, if I okay. recall. Uh, here's what I'd be happy with, I, given the shortness of time. I would be happy if you and Aaron conferred, and if the two of you are happy with the Latina woman who who applied. It was a, it was a male. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh -huh. and, and the objection from um, the, the three members of the NAACP was that there was not a, um, a close enough tie to Boulder. And my argument was that sometimes it's really good to have somebody outside of the community to give a different 
mm. take on things. Sure. Um, so, um, yeah. So I guess I, I personally, I would be happy <laughs> to delegate to you and Aaron the decision um, to, to appoint the 13th person. If the two of you want to open it up and see where else applies, that's fine. But I would also be fine if you and Aaron are happy with the um, Latino gentleman that um, applied that you advocated for. I'd be perfect. I trust your judgment and in, in, in Aaron's, and I'd be perfectly happy to delegate that decision to the two of you. That's my view. Yeah, I'm okay with that. I mean, I, I also feel like. Um, in the interest of transparency and cooperation that you should let the other three members of the committee know what you're up to and know mm -hmm. what council has said as far as you know that you and Aaron can um, make that appointment but um, it sure seems like they should at least be informed um, of, of if that's what we decide to do. So what you're saying is Aaron and I would make the appointment as opposed to having the committee, if I'm understanding correctly? Well, that's what Bob is suggesting. Yeah. Are you comfortable or uncomfortable with that? Um, if you all um, concur. Um, it's mostly for me in the interest of time. I, I would say the same thing. In order to expedite the process and move forward, I'm comfortable with doing that as well. I'm okay. <coughs> okay. Okay, very good. So is that everything you need, Jane? So I will, um, I'll, I'll have a conversation with Aaron. Okay. Yes, okay. absolutely. And, and then you'll work with Amy, Amy we'll me, and me. We'll work yeah. with Amy. We'll yeah. Figure that out. Okay, great. Okay, next is asylum seeker discussion and so Mary. That's also me. Um, so last week I received an email from um, Nicole Malaku, who is the um, executive director of the Colorado Immigrant Rights Coalition. And um, in it, she wrote that a partner organization um, had notified her that there have been asylees that have been getting um, bust from El Paso to Colorado. And she was looking for communities um, in Colorado that could house these um, asylees who are basically getting bust and waiting to be placed with their families while their applications are processed. Um, so it's a 72 hour um, need for housing for these individuals. Um, and I just this afternoon received an email from Nicole again saying that possibly this weekend there is a group of 20 arriving. Um, Sam and I had spoken with um, some, some nonprofits in the city as well as um, Sam spoke with, um, with um, Chief Calderazzo and um, we both spoke with Kurt and the idea was to um, minimize the impact on staff and um, since it's 20, I'm thinking just, and I will share this with you, is that um, the low number would probably, um, could probably be handled by putting out a call to community members to house individuals. So um, in which case it could be handled completely outside mm -hmm. the city. So that's what I'm thinking right now. Um, ideas? I just have a question to educate myself, uh, Mary. Why is it only 72 hours? No. That's a really good question. <laughs> I don't know why it's only 72 hours. I, I, it, it was, um, they're getting bust, they, they need 72 hours, and Nicole just said just enough time to, um, get some food, take a shower, and regroup, and then um, then they would need transportation out to either the airport or a bus to meet to their final destination. So, so they're, they're, um, the, the, the families or places that are ultimately gonna take them in long-term have already been identified, and, and they're just transit trans through? Yes, group. correct. Got it, correct. okay, that's helpful, thanks. So, um, yeah, so that's the latest that I have, and um, and since it's only 20, I'll, I'll get more information on that, and perhaps um, we can put it out to um, community members who might be interested in helping, and I would suspect that, and I would put it out to the community, I'm sure people are watching at 10 o'clock right now, <laughs> and um, put it out to, to the community and ask, perhaps ask the daily camera to put this front and center. <laughs> um, so the contact person, and I'll just go ahead and say this. Um, 
and then we search for that email. Um, the contact person would be Jennifer Piper, and um, her email address is J Piper, J P I P E R, at A F S C dot org. Okay. Well, good. Thanks for bringing this up, and we can use our networks to support <clears throat> these folks when they get in our community. Um, so, Jane, you already touched on the last item on the agenda, which is the FAA. So, we're going to have the mayor sign yes. a letter requesting the flight paths to be moved even further right. south. Yep. Great. Yes. Perfect. And then, any discussion items or debrief from this meeting? It's, well, thanks. It's the I, smallest I, council I, meeting I can remember. This is the first time that I recall getting out when we've had a business meeting before 10. So, hooray. Well, I'm, I'm sure it's no reflection on let's, those who are not here. No, no. <laughs> gavel. Gavel. Okay, here we go. Meeting adjourned. All right. Whoa. Unbelievable. Live from Paris, on France 24.